Hey everybody, Sean here, and I hope you're doing well. This video was the first video I ever made, and it's a four-hour collection of material from many of the false teachers today. I've now added timestamps so that you can click on specific teachers and movements. But this is a good video to share and show many of the false teachings out there and how many are teaching the same false things. And you can always get more information on specific teachers and topics in the Revealing Truth playlists. Just click on playlists at the top and you'll see a variety of topics. May that be on specific false teachers, churches, or shows or topics like how to share the gospel and salvation. But there's many things you may find interesting. And this number tells you how many videos there are in each of the sections. So there are close to 900 videos so far on revealing truth to keep you busy with. But regardless of the topic or person you're most interested in learning more on, if you like longer videos, then this video is for you. In Matthew 24, 5, the apostles asked Jesus what the sign of his coming would be. The first thing Jesus said was, let no one deceive you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and deceive many. In Matthew 24, 11, he also said, and many false prophets will arise and mislead many. And again, in Matthew 24, 24, he said, For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders that would deceive even the elect, if that were possible. Jesus stressed three times the importance of not being deceived by false teachers in these final days. One of the scariest verses in the Bible to me is Matthew 7, 22 and 23, where Jesus said, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. It's a scary thought because these are people that when they die and stand before Jesus, they will recognize him as Lord and declare that in life they called him Lord. They cast out demons. They prophesied and did many miracles in his name. They preached the name of Jesus and did things in the name of Jesus like so many we see today, but they were not of Jesus. For me, this is a troubling topic because I've seen a lot of people that in word and deed seem to be on fire Christians doing amazing things for the kingdom. But Jesus tells us that there would be many like this in the final days. Mark 13, 22 says, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. So once again, these are people that call Jesus Lord and do amazing signs and wonders in his name, but they are not true followers of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15 says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. So these are liars, people saying they follow Jesus, but they don't. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. We have to understand that false teachers are not always going to be easy to spot. Romans 16, 18 tells us, For such people are not serving our Lord Christ but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. So the Bible tells us that they're going to be charismatic, smooth talking people that preach about Jesus with passion and excitement and do amazing miracles in Jesus name. But all along, they are the false teachers we are warned of. We must take this very seriously. So how can we discern the true people of God in these last days? Now, before we go any further, we have to understand that there are many topics within the Christian body and churches that people don't agree on, but these don't affect someone's salvation. The rapture and tribulation timing is a hot topic in these end days. Is there a rapture? Is it a pre-tribulation rapture, a mid-trib rapture, a pre-wrath rapture, or a post-tribulation rapture? And is the rapture seven years or three and a half years? What about the 1,000-year reign of Christ? Is it premillennial, amillennial, or postmillennial? 
Another topic is spiritual gifts and if they still exist today or if they stopped with the apostles. What about Calvinism, Arminianism, or something in between? And the list goes on. The point is that we can have disagreements in these areas, and for the most part, they do not affect the message of salvation of Jesus dying for our sins. And I know there are extreme Christians on YouTube that want to expose everyone for everything, calling them a false prophet. But is that really love? And are they really doing it to help other Christians? We don't need to call everybody out on everything that we disagree on. But there are certain topics that people have twisted scripture about and therefore teach a different Jesus. We are warned in 2 Corinthians 11.4, for if someone comes along and preaches another Jesus than the one we preached, or should you receive a different spirit from the one you received or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you are too willing to listen. And Galatians 1.8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach another gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. So we are told that there will be people that come to us preaching Jesus, but it won't be the real Jesus, and that many people are too willing to listen to this. Once again, scripture has told us this would happen in the last days. In 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, it says, now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. And 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4 says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. So once again, how can we tell which of the teachers today are the false teachers? We can't rely on personal opinions. We must always look at what God says in the Bible. I judge no one, God is the only judge, and only he knows if people are truly his or if they've just misunderstood scripture. But I want to show you some clips of people that seem to fall into the category of false teachers according to the Bible and allow you to discern with God's truth in you. And most of the apparent false teachers today all seem to be part of the same group, the Word of Faith movement or the New Apostolic Reformation. So we'll look more into that. Let's start with someone that's pretty easy to identify as a false teacher. Todd Bentley is a very popular so-called pastor, and it amazes me that anyone truly seeking Jesus would believe a word he says. As you will see, his fruit does not match up with what the Bible says is good fruit. <laughs> the Lord told me, um, and remember, I didn't know he had a broken sternum or broken yeah. ribs. The Lord said, I want you to punch him in the sternum as hard as you can. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, you know, restoration, Rick's here, my first service, uh, you know, God, you want me to punch this guy? And I, it just didn't make sense to me. And I thought, Lord, he's dying. You know, he, he yeah. lost over 40 pounds. So anyways, I punched him in that broken sternum and he ended up on the ground and just vibrating under the power of God. He gets up and immediately you could see a change in his face and his yeah. countenance. And uh, long story short, he was totally healed of cancer. The broken sternum was healed. The ribs were healed. Instantly. Instantly. With the punch. With he the got punch. healed. It didn't hurt him. I said, God, I've prayed for like a hundred crippled people. Not one. He said, that's because I want you to grab that lady's crippled legs and bang them up and down on the platform like a baseball bat. <laughs> I walked up and I grabbed her legs and I started going, be healed! Be healed! I started banging them up and down on the platform. She got healed. And I'm thinking, God, why is not the power of God moving? He said, because you haven't kicked that woman in the face. <laughs> and there's this older lady worshiping right in front of the platform. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The gift of faith came on me. He said, kick her in the face <laughs> with your biker boot. I inched closer and I went like this. And just as my boot made contact with her nose, she fell into the power of God. And I saw him, and the gift of faith came on me. I said, what do I do, God? And God told me to just run him down. So I jumped up in the air, and I went, bam! And I hit him to the ground, jumped onto him, and got into 
do a full mount. Ground and pound. I jumped on there and I was in a full mount and something came over me and instead of punching I grabbed him by the neck and started choking him. And I said, come out of him devil! Come out of him devil! And I was in another meeting one time and I called out this Chinese gentleman. And all of a sudden I went running down the aisle and I, I hit this guy so hard it drove him back several feet. He hit the ground and his tooth popped right out of his mouth. The pastor was lying on the floor and I was standing up on the platform and I said, God, I want revival. And he said these words to me, leg drop the pastor. So he's got me in this meeting, and he's leading this meeting, this little charismatic Catholic meeting, and, and they're focusing on the gifts of the Spirit. And as I'm sitting there, I hear the audible voice of the Lord, and here's what God says to me. He says, Todd, go up to Frenchie and tell him that you have a demon. I said, what? I said, how can I have a demon? You know, I don't have a demon. And so he said, yeah, I want you to go tell him that you have a demon. And so right in the middle of this service, I walk up to him, and I, I, I whisper into his ears, Frenchie, I have a, and I start manifesting a demon. In fact, it wasn't my voice anymore. I was so possessed by this spirit that literally my voice started speaking in another voice. But yet I was still aware of the fact that I'm Todd Bentley. I'm here. There's a voice speaking out of my mouth. That's not my voice, but I have no control. I can't, I can't get myself back and I can feel something rising up and through my flesh, not my spirit, but through my flesh, there's a demonic power controlling me. It throws me onto the floor and I start writhing like a snake. I smash the coffee table and I start grabbing people that are in the room and I just throwing them around up against the bookcase. I mean, I'm thrashing this lady's house and I'm like an uncontrollable writhing servant on the serpent on the floor speaking in a different voice and cursing and profanities coming out of my mouth. And as that's happening, I'm saying, I love Jesus. This can't be happening to me. I don't have demons. I love Jesus. And the whole time I'm cursing the very people that I love and I'm, I can't stop, you know? And so he jumps on me and he starts performing deliverance. And the first spirit that came out of me was fear. That was the first demon. It was a demon of fear. And then he starts dealing with all these other demonic spirits. And every time he would call out another spirit, but he was operating in the gift of the discerning spirits, he'd call out another spirit's name and I'd go, I'd get more violent. And, and it took like eight people to try to hold me down. They were sitting on my body, sitting on my legs and on my arms and whatever. And I'm still writhing up and down. And 25 demons were cast out of me that night. But it was a great time. And there, it was a time of the supernatural, too. Um, we had manifestations of, of diamonds that came right out of heaven. Oh. We've had some of the diamonds we've been receiving here in Abbotsford examined by uh, jewelers. One, one diamond was examined by three jewelers. And the value, the diamond was so perfect and without flaw, we couldn't get a value on it. Uh, another diamond was valued at $40,000. And so great things have been happening. We had gold dust fall uh, it, it on people's hands. E even at one point, we were receiving an offering, and one individual was like, ah, I've already given the offering. I'm not going to give again. And he picked up his envelope, and it was covered in gold dust. He thought, well, I better give. <laughs> no, listen. Don't. Don't. Wait. Wait. <laughs> hey, 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 Todd. Check this out. She had an issue of blood. You called it out. She's all hooked up. She's healed. Debbie. You're here. Introducing Debbie. Debbie, why don't you tell us what happened? I've been coming here and watching on the internet, and it's been 27 days oh my that my issues resolved. And I, I was coming so here because of a car accident because I had slipped discs. You're healed. And on the stairs, my arms started to get on fire where I'm having the pain from the car accident, and I'm fine. While I'm standing there, I got healed in my shoulder and my neck. Hey, guess what? But, <laughs> you feeling a little drunk right now? 
Oh my god! <laughs> Something's happening! Why can't I just move in healing and forget talking about all that other stuff? He said, because, Todd, you got to get the people to believe in the angel. I said, God, why do I want people to believe in the angel? Isn't it about getting the people to believe in Jesus? He said, the people already believe in Jesus, but the church doesn't believe in the supernatural. What we do need to understand, what we need to address now, angels are messengers. One thing, they're not, you know, we, we do not worship angels. No. Uh, we don't command angels. Even Jesus didn't do that when he walked the earth as a man. No. He said, if I ask my father, yeah. will he not send a he legion directs. of angels? You, you know, and uh... open up those heavens and let the angels come down with fire. Let the angels come down with fire. That's not seeking angels because we never seek angels. Our conversation is directed. Father God, I thank you. There are angels yeah. and, and there's. Angels, 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 angels. That's not seeking angels because we never seek angels. Open heavens, open up, and I say angels, 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 hang up. That's not seeking angels because we never seek angels. And I want you to lift up your voice and call down the angel. Just angels, ain't come on, God send them. Angels, 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 come on, God send them. Angels, angels, and come on. But when you mention I saw an angel, a red flag goes up in them, not because they go, well, I don't know if I believe you saw an angel, Todd, so much, just as that rubs me wrong, because in the past, I, when I hear that kind of language, I saw an angel, I think of all the mess that comes along with it. That mm. person never preached the word, and, and I don't know that their life was committed to the word. Yeah. And, and I think that's important. These are things we have to look at. We have to be, you know, we're also warned to don't be puffed up by these things and watch out for those who are puffed yeah. up and using them. And without my testimony of the supernatural, the seer realm, the revelatory realm, the miracles that have been happening in this meeting would not be happening. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. I think a big problem that people have with with the angels and rightly so mm -hmm. is all the abuse and 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 the lack of fruit that's come after somebody's claimed they've had this oh, great yeah. big spiritual experience the I, I think a lot of people believe in the angels, but, but they see people running around having these experiences that aren't anchored in the Word, and they don't know the Word, and they don't preach the Word. They preach experiences. And An angel comes to me about seven days before I'm commissioned into full-time ministry. About seven days. Towers through the apartment above me, a 14-foot tall angel or whatever. And as soon as I went to go to sleep, a white lightning bolt came into my hotel room and as quickly as I could scream the name of Jesus, an angel stepped out of the white lightning bolt and stuck his hand in my belly and on an electrical current, I was electrocuted. We've had a lot of experiences we'll share and even though we share them and share them as experiences, we don't make doctrine out of experiences either. Right. The scriptures are for that. We don't accept as anything is doctrine in the church that you can't clearly point to Paul, in scripture. Paul, I saw the angel. And when you came out here tonight, Paul, the angelic activity was released in the stadium. And then I turned around and I saw Paul Cain step onto the grass. Uh, Todd, uh, Bentley and I together, the angel of the Lord said, you found what you're looking for. This is a man without guile, just as the, uh, the uh, man was up in the tree, and uh, what was the man? Uh, the whole... Zacchaeus. 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 Oh. No, no, no. Nathaniel. 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 Oh, Nathaniel, in whom there is no guile. And I couldn't believe it when people were criticizing Todd that surely he had some kind of guile in him. And
And, uh, you know, people ask all the time about Emma, and, and I do believe that an angel can take on a female form. But I, I made it clear in the last bulletin that we did that, that I've had experiences uh, on several occasions with an angel by the name of Emma. And uh, that angel is not, you know, the healing angel that I make reference to in my testimony when I talk about the angel of the Lord and the healing angel. But but I have had an experience and many other experiences with many other angels. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I'll say this for all the critics out there. What are you talking about, Emma and a female angel? Just had to say that for some people out there in heresy land. There is no female angel directing me. You, you take angels out of your Bible, you're not going to have a whole lot left. And I'm going to have my wife, Jessa, share a dream that she had. And I'm going to tell you what God's been speaking to me about. And I believe it's the key that's going to release the greatest miracle anointing for the church. Jessa. So a couple of nights ago, I had a dream where Oral Roberts was speaking to Todd. They were, I, I didn't understand what they're saying, but I remember they were talking. And then he looked over and he saw me and he stopped and he ran over to me and he put his hands over my eyes and he said, what do you see? And so I looked and I didn't see anything at first and then all of a sudden I saw this elephant racing across my eye and Oral Roberts said, he put his, his hands over my eyes and said, what do you see? And I said, I didn't see anything at first, and then all of a sudden I saw this elephant racing across my eyes, and it was, it was dancing, it was going crazy, it was just, it had this big smile, and it was just, just going crazy, and I said, it's a, a wild elephant, I see a wild elephant. And then I said, what's, what's with the elephant? He said, exactly, what is it with the elephant? And then I looked again, and in... In that vision, what was highlighted was the trunk of the elephant. I said, it's the elephant nose. And he said, yes. And I said, it's discernment. And he said, exactly. And then he says, do you see the lion? And I closed my eyes again, and then I saw the lion. And the lion, it was just a golden lion, and I woke up. And um, when I woke up, literally, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I just felt like the Lord was highlighting things to me about the dream. And in the dream, I thought it was pretty ironic that Oral Roberts put his hands he covered my eyes and said what do you see and I thought that was interesting because he's covering my eyes what do you see and I felt like the Lord was saying that that even more so now for the church today we need to walk by faith and not by sight what do you see you know I didn't see anything at first until I really looked and I pressed in you know and I saw the wild elephant and so when the elephant came running in and I said what is it with it so it's almost like what's with walking by faith how do you walk by faith and not by sight by discerning the times and the seasons just like the sons of Ishkar discerning that's what gives you hope when you're walking through a hard time and you're you know walk by faith when everything around you looks dark and dim is discerning the times and season by getting a hope from God um, whew, getting <laughs> Getting a hope from God <laughs> to be able to see, to discern the times and the seasons that's ahead of you. And the thing about the elephant, it wasn't just an ordinary elephant, it was a wild elephant. A wild elephant. It was radical, 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 radical. <laughs> wow. And the elephant means a great impact. And I really felt like what happened in Lakeland was just a beginning, it was just an introductory, it was just an introduction, just a table of contents 
of what's to come. And I felt like the great impact is greater, greater, greater. It's the great impact. And the greatest impact that you can have is bringing the kingdom of God to earth. It's to give an encounter of Jesus Christ to every single person. That's the greatest impact we can have. The great impact is the great revival. It's the great harvest. Whew, and it's going to be wild, wild. It's going to be much greater than it was before. Much greater. And the next thing, the last thing about the dream is once, once we as a church pray for revival and seek revival, that it becomes a lifestyle, just like Tom was saying, a lifestyle, not just something we contend for we want, but a lifestyle that we live in a culture of revival, then boldness is released upon the church. And that was the lion. When he said, do you see the lion? Because we need the wild elephant first before we can get the lion. And then that's where the boldness of the church is released. Oh. Shika. My wife's got some wildfire. On June 23rd, 2008, they held a special commissioning ceremony for Todd Bentley live at Lakeland with the very biggest apostles and prophets of the charismatic movement. This is Peter Wagner, the head apostle of the entire charismatic movement worldwide. And here's Rick Joyner, the top prophet of the movement. This commissioning represents a powerful spiritual transaction taking place in the invisible world. With this in mind, I take the apostolic authority that God has given me, and I decree to Todd Bentley, your power will increase. Your authority will increase. Your favor will increase. Your influence will increase. Your revelation will increase. Of course, only weeks later, Todd Bentley's movement completely fell apart, and no amount of Stacey Campbell shaking her head was going to change that fact. And receiving the tablets came after Numbers 24. Just a few weeks later, on July the 9th, ABC Nightline had a special on Todd Bentley and the Lakeland Revival. Little did we know this would be the beginning of the end of the revival. Can you supply us with three people who have been cured through miracle with their medical diagnosis, their names? But we never got three. Instead, we were given a binder filled with what Bentley says are stories of inspiring miracles. It offered incomplete contact information, a few pages of incomplete medical records, doctors' names were crossed out. And so, not a single miracle claim of Bentley's could be verified. But then came even more shocking news. Todd Bentley was separating from his wife. He'd apparently been having an affair with a female staff member even while the revival was going. And of course, at this point, the entire revival collapsed. Lee Grady, the editor of Charisma magazine, spoke for multitudes around the world when he wrote these words. Todd Bentley's announcement that his marriage is ending has thrown our movement into a tailspin and questions need to be answered. It was not supposed to end like this. But sadly, that was not the end. Todd Bentley divorced his wife, married his girlfriend, and the biggest prophetic ministry in the world, run by Rick Joyner, undertook a speedy restoration process to fast track Todd Bentley back on stage again. And now here he is, back again, ministering alongside his new wife. And the thing about the elephant, it wasn't just an ordinary elephant, it was a wild elephant, a wild elephant. As we've already seen, these same spasmodic head movements in Hinduism are taken as a sure sign of a kundalini awakening. Why then are we now seeing them in the church? It is for everyone, for every Christian. For and so, aided and abetted by some of the biggest names in Christendom, Todd Bentley and others continue to spread this anointing right through the charismatic church. Jesus, I pray some of you would feel like you're getting electrocuted. But this is not just about Todd Bentley and his friends. This is about thousands of charismatic leaders all over the world who made the decision not just to bring this stuff in and endorse it, but to actually transfer it onto their own people. And I don't care if, if it was peer pressure, uh, just because every other minister seemed to be getting into it. I don't care what the reasons were. 
th this is one of the worst, most disturbing movements that maybe the church has ever seen. And these guys brought it in deliberately into the church. And when the very top apostles and prophets in the entire charismatic movement can get up on a stage and endorse and promote and prophesy the grandest things over such a suspect movement that was obviously suspect right from the start, we've got to know our top leadership, they don't have any discernment. Your power will increase. Your authority will increase. Your favor will increase. We need a revolution in the leadership of the church. All right, folks. So we can see that Todd Bentley is definitely not a man of God. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and Todd did not show any of this. Uh, never in the Bible did God instruct somebody to kick a little old lady in the face to heal them, punch a dying man in the sternum, or any of the crazy stuff we saw Todd do. Uh, so if you know anybody who's following this man, please show him this video. Let them know that he's an imposter. Uh, now, we've got to look at where did all this start? Uh, a lot of this started back in the Word of Faith movement, and one of the biggest names in the Word of Faith that started with the Little Gods Theory and uh, so many other crazy, crazy unbiblical things is Benny Hinn. So rather than talk about him, let's take a look at Benny Hinn. These eyes. I have never lied to you. Never. I never will. I'd rather die than lie to God's people. God came from heaven, became a man, made man into little God, went back to heaven as a man. He faces the Father as a man. I face devils as the Son of God. You see what I'm talking about? You say, Benny, am I a little God? You're a son of God, aren't you? You're a child of God, aren't you? You're a daughter of God, aren't you? What, what else are you? Quit your nonsense. What else are you? If you say I am, you're saying I'm a part of him, right? Is he God? Are you his offspring? Are you his children? You can't be human. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? I, the Lord, with the first of them and with the last, I am He. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. I don't know whether people even know this, but he was the first superman that really ever lived. First of all, the scriptures declare clearly that he had dominion over the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, which means he used to fly. Whoa. Well, of course, how can you have dominion over the birds and not be able to do what they do? Whoa. Actually, I mean, the, wait a minute. I, wait a I'll minute. prove it to you. Wait a minute. <laughs> Danny. I've never heard that. The word have, dominion yes. in the Hebrew clearly declares that if you have dominion over a subject, that you do everything that subject does. In other words, that subject, if it does something you, you cannot do, you don't have dominion over it. I'll prove it further. Adam not only flew, he flew to space. He used to be, he, 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 he was with one thought, he'd be on the moon. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And you wonderful people of God, quit attacking of God by name. Somebody's attacking me because of something I'm teaching. Let me tell you something, brother. You watch it. 
Dear God in heaven, I wish I can just... Ooh. They call out the medicine in my foot. You know, I've looked for one verse in the Bible. I just can't seem to find it. One verse that said, if you don't like him, kill him. I really wish I could find it. <laughs> but don't mention people's names on your radio program and your TV program, thinking you're doing God's service. You're not. You stink, frankly. That's the way I think about it. Sometimes I wish God would give me a Holy Ghost machine and I'll blow your head off. But the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. These eyes. I have never lied to you. The Lord also tells me to tell you in the mid-90s, about 94, 95, no later than that. God will destroy the homosexual community of America. But he will not destroy it with what many minds have thought him to be. He will destroy it with fire. And many will turn and be saved, and many will rebel and be destroyed. The Spirit tells me, Fidel Castro will die in the 90s. Oh my! Some will try to kill him and they will not succeed. But there will come a change in his physical health, and he will not stay in power. And Cuba will be visited of God. The hour is urgent. Many of you have known me for many years. But I'm telling you right now, things I hadn't said years and years and years, and years ago. I believe, hear this, hear this. I believe that Jesus, God's Son, is about to appear physically in meetings and to believers around the world to wake us up. He appeared after his resurrection and he's about to appear before his second coming. You know, a prophet just sent me a word through my wife right here. And she said, tell your husband that Jesus is going to physically appear in his meetings. I'm expecting to see, I'm telling you that, I feel it's going to happen. I, 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 I'm I'm careful in how I'm saying it now because I know the people in Kenya are listening. I know deep in my soul something supernatural is going to happen in, Na in Nairobi, Kenya. I feel that. I may very well come back and you and Jen are coming. To Paul and Jen are coming to Nairobi with me. But Paul, we may very well come back with footage of Jesus on the platform. You know that the Lord appeared in Romania recently, and there's a video of it, where the Lord appeared in the back of a church, and you see him on video walking down the aisle? Yeah. Paul, do you remember when I came on TBN years ago and showed you a clip of the Lord appearing in our church in Orlando, on the balcony, on the wall? Yeah, you, you remember that? Very well. I, I saw it. That was 80, 80 something, 86, whatever. You know, I always wondered why the Lord, why did he do that? Do you know why now I look back? That was the beginning of the greatest move of God in our church. Because 83, 84 and, and 85 were horrible years for me. Horrible years. 86, the blessings of God began. But they began with, a, with, with this manifestation of the Lord's face on, on the balcony. That stayed for eight weeks. Eight solid weeks. The Lord has done this in the past. But he's about to do it again. Now hear this. I'm prophesying this. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is about to appear physically in some churches. And some meetings. And to many of his people. For one reason. To tell you he's about to show up. To wake up. Jesus is coming, saying.
Hinn admits he doesn't have medical verification of any of the healings, and in fact, some of the supposed healings have turned out to be not real at all. In Jesus' sweet name. Nine-year-old William Vandenkolk claimed his failing eyesight had improved at this Hin crusade in 2001. And as soon as God healed me, I could see better. William is now 17 and still legally blind. I'd say I was caught up in the moment, being as young as I was, thinking this could actually be possible, like I could actually be getting my vision back. But I was really little and I guess it was just the moment. Do you know that God never blesses sheep before he blesses shepherds? Shepherds get it first, then the sheep get it. Because sheep follow shepherds. If we, if, if we shepherds follow sheep, we're going to have poo on, on, on our shoes. <laughs> so, so. Is that an Israeli word? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> so, so the sheep must follow the shepherds. <laughs> And God always blesses the shepherds first. So a pastor can never see his church prosper if he's poor. See? Never. Well, it's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. On the cross, he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Isn't that right? Which means the Father left him. The Holy Ghost left him. When he went to the underworld, he did not go down as the Son of God. He went down as the Son of Man. Now, please listen. He hung on the cross as the Son of God. But he went to face Satan in his home, in the underworld, in hell, as the Son of Man. When he faced Satan, he faced him as a man, as a full man. And if a man destroyed Satan, Men can still destroy him. Give up the, he gave up the ghost. And he died. Went to the underworld, as I said earlier. And the following step says, and became obedient unto death. Isn't that right? In other words, separation from God. He's in the underworld now. God is in there. The Holy Ghost is in there. And the Bible says he was begotten. You know what the word begotten means? It means reborn. Don't let anyone deceive you. Jesus was reborn. You say, what are you talking about? Sir, please hear me. Did the father leave him? Come on, did the father leave him? Yes. That's death. Did the Holy Ghost leave him? Yes. That's death. Did the, did the Holy Ghost come back on resurrection morning? Yes. That's rebirth. He was reborn. He had to be reborn. That's, ha, have you ever read the words begotten from the dead? Reborn from the dead. As an example to me. If he was not reborn, I could not be reborn. Jesus was born again. He said, oh, really? Let me prove it to you. He was dead spiritually. He died spiritually. Sir, when the father leaves, you die. The father left him. Yes or no? Yes. The Holy Ghost left him. Yes or no? Yes. That's spiritual death. But when the Holy Ghost came back, he was begotten from the dead. He was born again. He was reborn. If he was not reborn, I would never be reborn. How can I face Jesus and say, Jesus... You went through everything I've gone through except the new birth. I got something you don't know. Uh-uh. Everything I've gone through, he went there first. I mean, you talk about watching God divide an ocean, taking the wheels of the chariots of the Egyptians, and here this wall of ice. It was, by the way, a wall of ice. If you read your scriptures, that's right. The Hebrew word... And I can show it to you after the show, Paul. But the Hebrew word, uh, 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 when God divided the, that Red Sea, as the wall stood, it actually froze with God's breath. So when the, when the water came down, it was ice coming that crushed the Egyptians. 
it's in the word. I'm sick and tired of hearing how it used to be back 40 years ago. I got so sick of it, I said, Lord, if I hear it one more time, I'm going to throw up. I want to see it now. I can have it here. He said, well, Benny Hinn, isn't that wonderful to have gold, streets, and glory? Well, of course. But if I hear the thing one more time of how it will be and how it was, I'm going to kick somebody. <laughs> Somebody says, why do you blow on people? I don't know. I just know that the Holy Spirit says, do it. And you know what? It works. Indeed, His glory reaches us all, especially those who have cable. <laughs> yeah, you guys take it. Kid, quickly. Take a fire, young man. You kids, come up here. Fire on you. My God. Pick him up. Fire on you. Pick him up. Fire on you. Fire on you. You do, Jack. But here's first what I see for, for TBN. You're gonna have people raised from the dead watching this network. You're gonna have people raised from the dead watching TBN. I'm telling you, I see this in the spirit. It's gonna be so awesome. Jesus, I give you praise for this. That people around the world, maybe not so much in America, people around the world who will lose loved ones, will say to undertakers, uh, not yet, I want to take my dead loved one and place them in front of that TV set for 24 hours. Benny, in. I'm telling you, Jesus. people will be, people, I'm telling you, I feel the anointing talking here. Hallelujah, Jesus. People are going to be canceling funeral services. Merciful God. And bringing their dead in their caskets. Placing them, my God, I feel they don't want to hear. Any placing them before a television set, waiting for God's part to come through and touch them. Merciful. I see rows of, um, ca of caskets lining up in front of this TV set. And I see him bringing them closer to the TV set. Mm -hmm. And as people are coming closer, I see uh, l l actually loved ones picking up the hands of the dead and letting them touch the screen. Mm -hmm. And people are, are getting raised Praise. as their hands are touching that screen. Mm -hmm. the, the glory of God will be so on TBN that there's going to be divine resurrection happening as people bring their loved ones to the TV set. TBN will no longer be just a television network. It will be an extension of heaven to earth. My Jesus, have mercy. Oh. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, the Lord, the Lord just a said to me, the Lord just said to me these words. I'm hearing myself saying for the first time, TBN will not be only a Christian network. It will be an extension of heaven to the earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. An extension, it'll be like a, like a tube from heaven that the earth can look and say, I'm looking at heaven. Yeah. I'm partaking of, of heaven. I'm, I'm, I'm getting connected to heaven through this TV tube. Mm -hmm. If I can say it, it will be heaven's signal to the earth. It would be as though heaven is transmitting and earth is receiving through that set. So if you want to go to heaven, you want to see heaven, you want to taste heaven, turn on that channel, because mm. you will. Mm, mm, mm. Televangelism is a $2 billion a year industry, and one of the hottest stars in religious broadcasting is Pastor Benny Hinn. Millions of people watch him on TV. You can see him here in Chicago on Channel 38. Tonight, in a news extra, Channel 2's Pam Zekman takes us on a leap of faith. 
that includes millions of dollars and a man some call a holy hustler. We are annoying Ken. We are annoying Ken. We are annoying Ken. They come by the thousands to sing, to pray, to weep, to be overcome by the Spirit of the Lord. They come seeking miracles, and Pastor Benny Hinn gives them what they want. Twelve empty wheelchairs in the first few minutes of the service. In crusades from coast to coast, Hinn preaches the power of God to heal cancer, make the deaf hear and the blind see. How many fingers? Five. Millions more see the healings on television. Some call him the miracle man. But critics, even those who believe in faith healing, are questioning Hinn's methods and his miracles. I command you spirit of deafness in Jesus' name. Come out! These two brothers from Chicago, born profoundly deaf, were declared healed. A third brother, also deaf, was supposedly healed even though he wasn't there. In proxy, his mama is standing. And I break the curse of deafness on her son. Now! Glory, glory, glory! That's pretty exciting, but there's one problem. The boys are still deaf. At our request, a school audiologist tested them. The boys continue to have the same hearing loss that we've been measuring for years. No miraculous healing. No miraculous healing. I believe he's committing fraud in the name of God. Hello. Hello. Hi. Go ahead. My question is, Jesus never asked for money. Why do you? Well, Jesus didn't have a TV program. We Are you saying if he, if he returned, he would have a TV program? <laughs> he may. Miracles. Yeah, I was in Ghana just recently. We had half a million people show up, and a man was ra raised from the dead on the platform. That's a fact, people. I, that's a fact. A man was raised from the dead on the platform. We have it on video. For three months, we persistently requested an interview with Pastor Hinn about that claim and others. But the only interview we were granted was with the executive producer of his TV show, who admits there is no videotape of a man being raised from the dead. In a more recent book, Welcome Holy Spirit, Pastor Hinn claims that during a 1976 visit to a hospital in Sault Ste. Marie, his preaching triggered a mass healing of many patients. We called the hospital, the hospital said it never happened. Never happened. He had come there for a service in the chapel. It was uneventful, he left, and their exact words were no patients left the hospital that day. Benny wants you to know he donates lots of his money back to his own church, but when others dig deep to donate money to his ministry, all they want in return is a prayer. Many write the miracle they need on the envelope that contains their donation, and Benny promises to pray for them. The money is always removed and hauled off to the bank, but where did we find a number of prayer requests left on the floor for the trash man to sweep away? This woman's prayer request was one of them. Oh my goodness. I found it on the floor with the envelope ripped open and the money taken out. Oh no. We're not talking about one or two. Give me favor with employment. Help me with a financial yeah, wait, blessing. Wait, wait, Help wait, wait. me get out of debt. I give you my last $20 in this morning session. The money is gone. The prayer request is on the floor waiting for the garbage. Steve, day. I did not know about that. All I know is whoever is responsible for leaving these prayer requests behind in Houston will be fired. Someone's eyes have just been healed. Up. Will you praise Jesus? But Benny doesn't need any proof to still believe in miracles, like the claim that these three are healed of AIDS. You put them on television. Have you ever seen a blood test? I do know that there are individuals. Have you ever seen a blood test? No. We, who had the AIDS? Burn every bit of it. Burn every bit of it in Jesus' name. We check it the best we know how, really. You don't, you don't check it at all, Pastor. There's only one way to tell if somebody has AIDS. Oh, they have to go back to the, to the doctor and check it. And you haven't seen a single blood test. So how well can no, you check? I can't answer that. So next Saturday night, who are they in bed with? Thinking they don't have AIDS, they can't reinfect anybody else. Have you done those people they sleep with any good? I have given my life to help people. I'm not perfect. All the pain is gone. She's out of the wheelchair. She's been healed by God's power. She's a victim of brain cancer. This is marvelous. Her family has driven her hundreds of miles for the cancer to be healed tonight. It would be better if it goes. Satan, you lost this one and you'll never get her back again. 
Three weeks later, while Benny was running and rerunning the miracle on TV, she was still sure x-rays would show no cancer. But we were there when she went for further tests. She has not been healed. Her kind of terminal cancer has never been known to just disappear. You say it's I am gone. Told by my, I'm told by my staff, this lady had this, it's gone. But there's no way you and can know I if that's pray. true. Well, not with all of them. Not with most of them. No, not with all. Not with most well, that's your opinion. That lady Benny is calling down from the choir didn't call her doctor either before she went home and put away her heart medicine because Benny told her God had healed her. You, you don't plan to take it? Uh, no, no, I've got a healing from the Lord, no. Look, 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 it's not my job to call their doctor. All things are possible, Lord. A lot of the healings sound incredible, and sometimes nobody in the place seems more stunned than Pastor Benny. But no matter how incredible the cure, he will use them on his TV show, This Is Your Day, without even checking back with the individual for verification. Anybody could make up anything. Someday somebody's going to do that. And what are you going to say then? I don't know. I can't tell you now. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. Oh, yes, it has. Remember that woman supposedly cured of polio? Pastor Benny knows it made for a great episode of his TV show. He knows it probably helped squeeze even bigger donations from his flock. But there's something he doesn't know. Pastor, Steve, all I know is... Pastor, let me, let me just no, say no, something. Let me say something. Go ahead. That woman works for us. Woman doesn't have polio, never did. Then why did she say she had? We put her up there to see if he could tell her story was not true. To see if it would matter. To see if he would ever check. And you sat right here and told me a few moments ago, we never put him on television unless we checked. You never called that woman. You never called her doctor. You did no checking whatsoever. Well, she was one we missed. And speaking of missed, who missed the truth about this woman who claimed to be born profoundly deaf, unable to hear a word? And now you can hear me. Yes. There was plenty of time to thoroughly check her story before publishing his latest book, but apparently nobody bothered. In your book, the last chapter, it says Candace Brousseau was born profoundly deaf in both ears. Correct. But Candy's doctor, Howard House, he's treated her more than 35 years, and he knows Benny's claim in the book is simply not true. She was born with a very severe hearing loss. She was not born deaf. Lord, if people attack this book, let it sell more. If there's a mistake, he promises to correct it the in the next printing. In Jesus' mighty name now. So, Benny, is it faith or is it fraud? I'm still a human being like you. Made many mistakes, big ones. And will still make mistakes. But I really want to do better. I really want to. These eyes. I'm working for my uncle. I've got same I have that. never I'm going to serve him. This isn't, you know, begrudgingly. I'm excited to work for him. And so we start traveling and flying and enjoying this private plane and enjoying the world and, and doing ministry. And before you know it, I start to have some pretty deep questions. Yeah. I had had some questions growing up, like, why don't my friends want to come to our church? Because <laughs> we're always doing healing services. And why don't you know, my friends really ever want to come back to my church if they do come visit? Because we did a lot of weird stuff. You know, we had some holy water campaigns and my dad would always lay hands on people and we were always speaking in tongues like non-stop and, and we'd be yelled at <laughs> non-stop lift up your hands and pray in the holy ghost pray in the holy ghost begin to pray in the spirit and the whole church would speak in tongues and you would as a kid and you were taught to and told to and prayed on and laid hands on to speak in tongues and so you just your friends don't want to come back to that they're going this is weird uh, which only gives further evidence now in hindsight to why the tongues in the Bible were known languages and mm -hmm. also they were almost useless if, if people didn't understand what was going on. Or an interpreter. Or an interpreter is present. So yeah, in every sense, I just, my friends wouldn't come back to that craziness. And so, but I'd put those questions aside because again, you don't speak against a man of God. I revered my uncle and my father. You don't come at them and start saying you're wrong. You simply follow because they are anointed and maybe God is doing something that you don't understand. That was the approach. And, uh, but I could never reconcile why the healing in the Bible didn't match the healing in the Crusades and why even the teachings in the Bible didn't always line up with the teachings in the Crusades. But I, I couldn't figure out what was true north still. So I'd have a thought, think something like, you know, why don't people get healed instantaneously? Why is it kind of this four-hour service leading up to it? 
Didn't Jesus just heal instantly in the Bible? And then I thought, well, you know, maybe sometimes people's faith makes it a little hard uh, and it takes a little longer. And so there were just lingering questions that I had. And uh, he says, guys, don't worry about the scouts. Relax. Just play the game. Go out and have fun. And everything we did, it was all for the glory of God. He said, play the game for the glory of God. That's everything about baseball was win or lose, we play for the glory of God. And so I'm going, okay, God's glory. Not sure what that means. That, when I grew up, God's glory was hitting the choir and they would fall. And my uncle would yell fire and the glory would hit everyone. <laughs> to me, that was glory. Well, Coach Hefner is going, you know, for the glory of God. Okay, for the glory of God, sure. And then he says something I'll never forget. Don't worry about the scouts. God is sovereign. Uh, Proverbs says, and he says, the king's heart is like water in the channels of the hand of the Lord. He turns them wherever he wishes. He turns the king's heart, guys. He can control the scouts. He's sovereign. And I thought, sovereignty? Okay, how do I get on the good side of sovereignty? You'd okay. never heard that before. Oh, word of faith, kid. To me, sovereignty is, okay, God decrees and I get. God, God, God decrees and I'm the benefactor. Uh, I speak it and God does it. That's sovereignty, is that he, he works for me. And so we start dating, and as, a, as a, a young man, I'm able to teach her a lot of the basics. I teach her about the gospel. I teach her about the Trinity. I know these things because I grew up in church. And, you know, there's some additions to the word of faith theology. You know, I wasn't going into the, the Satan's nature on, you know, Jesus taking on Satan's nature on the cross, any of the heresies, or, you know, explaining to her that, well, God... You know, Jesus wasn't really fully God. He did his miracles as a man, like some of the, the word of faith heresy. And that's thought. some of the things we have on video of your uncle teaching. Oh, absolutely. That Jesus came to earth as a man, later became God, went to hell as a man, defeated Satan as he a man. Was born again. Yes, yeah, born again. Bill Johnson teaches that as you're going to have. Copeland's another one. Yeah, and so, by the way, Costi has a book, and he'll have, in this book, he'll have things where he's exposing Jesus culture, word of faith, Bill Johnson, and those sort of things. Yeah, we'll try to explain it to people yeah. really well. It comes down to a relationship. My parents say, uh, basically, uh, you know, she, she's not spirit-filled. She doesn't speak in tongues. Now, they later have since changed their position. I've talked to them about this since, and they, they now do not believe tongues is evidence of salvation or uh, essential for salvation. But at the time, <laughs> if you can't get your kid to, to not want to marry somebody, you, you know, sooner or later, you just got to give in, give in and, and, and love them and, and try to have some sort of relationship. But along the way, the plan was to fix her up. So, so they bring her to one of your uncle's meetings for him to lay hands on her. Oh, absolutely. So, and then my, my, my dad and, you know, there's other laying hands moments and bless her heart. She tried so hard. She did everything she was supposed to do. She fell. At one, you know, when she got her, put her little hands in the air and she fell and tipped, tipped over on her little heels. and her Trying to be little, slain in the spirit. Oh, yeah. Trying to be slain in the spirit, which she now, to be fair to her, she describes as a very, very... Uh, she used the word creepy, just a, a, a weird feeling, almost demonic. Uh, so I, I've never really said that. But well, she was a believer at that point. She was. And here's what, I, if you ask me now, well, what do you think that was? Real simple. A believer in that environment is going to feel really, really weirded out. And feeling, under conviction. And under conviction. This is not of God. This is, of, this is darkness. This is not light. I don't belong here. A sheep is going to say, no way. Is this the shepherd's voice? And no way is this the shepherd's fold. And so while I'm studying, I have no idea how to study except to try to gather a bunch of information, convey the text appropriately, illustrate well, shed light on it. You know, Spurgeon always said illustrations are like a window on the sermon. They just shed light on the point. You don't need to add much more. And my pastor comes over and tosses a, a John MacArthur commentary on my desk. He says, this will help. It'll kind of keep you in line. You'll be just, you know, read that, get the breadth of the text, understand the depth of it, kind of move through it and understand it. The commentary will help you with that. You know, big introductions and mm -hmm, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You start to get the idea, Greek words and, and all of the above. Well, in studying that, this is where I believe my conversion took place. I'm reading through it and MacArthur has a line in his commentary, and he writes, you know, the man didn't know who Jesus was. When the Pharisees went and asked him, who told you you can pick up your pallet and walk, the man didn't know who Jesus was. And he says, this, therein, lies the, the, or therein is the cruelest lie of faith healers today, that if you just have enough faith, you'll get healed. Well, that blew my mind. 
I was absolutely shocked. I thought, what? what? Oh my goodness, we're wrong. We, meaning the hens, my family, what we teach, we're wrong. This is not an argument about sign gifts and cessationism and continuous. And all. This is just, we're wrong about lying to people and putting burdens on them that if you just have enough faith, God will heal you. That was flat out wrong, and it was the first time I'd ever been faced with it. That's right. No one's wielding it. Yes. Otherwise, they'd wield it like men teach, or they'd wield it like somebody is merciful. I mean, you don't, you don't, you don't, you just, if you're merciful, you're merciful. It's a spiritual gift, and you're, you're a kind, compassionate person. Wielding is, you know, you fling it around. You got healing. You just walk into a hospital. In name of Jesus Christ, heal. Boom. Instant. Up. And yet they're not well, doing that. They're not. So that's not the sign gifts. Does God heal? Yes, but you're right. It's not a wielding of these gifts. So that just wrecks me. And then there was another thing on that point. As I noticed in the text, Jesus heals the man instantly. Rise and walk. Get up. Take your pallet. And this guy. So I thought, no, we do four-hour services. We have to have atmosphere we have to have long music. We have to line them up. We have to say, God's going to touch you tonight. Uh, we don't need to do the four-hour lead-in if we really got the gifts of healing and we're really healing people. That's got to be false too. So I begin to look through the scriptures and see continually Jesus healing instant, 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 instant. Only time in Mark, remember he has to heal the, prays for the blind guy twice. And then what does he do? He goes and teaches his disciples something about it. He prayed for the man twice for a purpose, to teach something. That's the exception, though. That's not the norm. The norm was Jesus always healed instantly. That was false in our world. We did not do that. So why I also say that was my conversion experience. You talk about the fruit and the evidence of salvation. I wanted nothing more to do with the word of faith. Uh, I didn't know who any of you guys were. I didn't, I didn't know anything except I don't want that. That's false. I want what the word says. I want what Jesus actually did. I want what the New Testament actually taught. I want to know my role and do it. I'm not an apostle. I'm not going to be an apostle. I'm not a prophet. I'm not going to be a prophet. What does the New Testament command of me, a disciple of the disciples, a result of those founding apostles? I'm getting responses from family members now saying, listen, you know, we've seen all the stuff you're doing. Please understand, we don't believe all that anymore. Our family members that are, that are following false teaching and caught in it, we... I got help because there were relationships. If people would have said, no, you're a hen. If my coach would have said, oh, no, 2 John 9 to 11, no greeting for you, hen kid, and took it wrong, who would have helped me? I wasn't a false teacher. I was a follower. So you're right. Family members, too, we got to stand for truth, not worry about embarrassment, not worry about what everyone thinks, and not also just cut everyone off. We maintain a level of relationship so that we can reach out to them. But as I said, I do keep complete arm's length, arm's distance. I do not call my uncle and just shoot the breeze. He's false teaching, and I think he knows on some level. Um, but with my dad and mom, others, most of the family that followed him into this, I'm keeping relationship on some level for the purpose of evangelism. Absolutely. But you know, and then I got some other family members that are heavily involved with Bethel. We don't really speak. You're talking about Bethel Church in Redding, California, Bill Johnson, Johnson, absolutely. Jesus they're, Culture, and New Apostolic Reformation. Yes, they're in tight, in tight. Again, another family member working with Todd White, um, a lot of these guys that are doing this stuff. And they, you know, that's where I think they've all like blocked me on social media. They, they don't want to talk to me more than anything. Um, what drives many of these false teachers, you think, whether it's Joyce Meyer or your uncle or Kenneth Copeland or anything, what do you think drives them? Is it money? Is it fame? Do they really believe what they're teaching? Mm -hmm. Money, power, and then darkness. So some of them, I believe, and the scripture teaches this, that there are those that are deceiving and being deceived. Uh, 2 Peter 2, the entire chapter is about false teachers. Jude, the whole book. About apostasy. Second, uh, Jude is. Jude is all about apostasy. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, that false professors, false teachers, false prophets disguised as workers of righteousness. So darkness appoints, they're destined to it. Darkness appoints some of them. They do it because they're under the demonic control. They've been given over. Absolutely. Romans 1, given over to all of it. Um, and then power and money would be the other two things. I would just say that's always been the, the downfall of, of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's involved in politics, involved in everything. In the life. flesh. That, that's right. Loving the world system. Absolutely. So uh, those would be the three. Money, power, and then 
darkness. Why is Bethel dangerous? Why is Bill Johnson and the New Apostolic Reformation uh, heretical? Which is picking up a ton of kids. Yes. And and this includes IHOP and Mike Bickle. Yeah, I'm a millennial. I, I'm seeing it like crazy in my generation. It's emotion. It's music. And we love our music. We love emotion. We want to... You know, we don't want to be all cold and dry. It's also a spiritual salve. And so that's what sucks us in mm -hmm. is the millennials are going, yeah, this looks real. It looks really fun. And then all of a sudden the bait and switch is, oh, here's our heretical teacher. Mm -hmm. So we answer the big question in one of the segments, what does Bill Johnson teach and why is it heretical? And I quote him from his books, from his teaching, and we'll answer that question. What about um, people that are in the Word of Faith that are watching this? Because I know this is going to get out there and go around. What would you say to someone who's being skeptical and trying in their mind to refute you? What would you say to the Word of Faith person listening right now? Oh, man, I, from, from experience, I would say that we're, we were wrong. We were. That Jesus didn't take Satan's nature uh, that Jesus was fully man and fully God. The scriptures teach that clearly. He didn't do miracles as a man in right relationship with God. He did his miracles as fully God. Say, so come back to the orthodox circles of Christianity. If you were to tighten that circle up, things like the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the inerrancy of scripture, uh, proper soteriology, understanding salvation, all those things. The kenosis, you talk about Christ emptying himself. Come back to orthodoxy and don't teach things like Jesus had to be born again. That's right. Which is what we see Bill Johnson and your uncle teaching. That's the deity of Christ. Yes. The Trinity. Don't mess with the Trinity. I would say come back to the circles that are orthodox. And then outside, if you had concentric circles, outside of that, okay, let's talk about you know eschatology or let's talk about the sign gifts. But get the essentials right. come back to the essentials and we get fellowship. The assemblies of God, you've got to remember this, they, their ties with Bethel and Bill Johnson are over. My uncle got his papers revoked. John Wimber and the Vineyard Association of Churches booted the Toronto Airport Church in 1994 with John Arnott, the Toronto mm -hmm. Blessing, all mm -hmm. that revival stuff. They didn't like that. So we can't lump every Pentecostal and no. charismatic into this category. That's right. So that's also my encouragement. So another guy that was there at the beginning was a man named Kenneth Copeland. And him and Benny are still going strong today, but... Once again, they were two of the originals that started uh, the big movements in the Word of Faith movement that so many are still following today. And we're going to see through this video that birds of a feather flock together, and they're all still proclaiming that Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn are great men of God when you can see plainly they teach unbiblical doctrine, uh, lies against what God says in the Bible. Uh, these are not men of God. These are false prophets leading the sheep astray. Let's take a look at Kenneth Copeland. Who is the big, who's the biggest failure in the Bible? God is. What you say? <laughs> you know, everybody asks you, say, who's the biggest failure? They say, Judas. Somebody else will say, no, I believe it's Adam. Well, how about the devil? He's the most consistent failure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he's not the biggest in terms of material failure and so forth. The biggest one in the whole Bible is God. Mm. Oh, what, what, what? Don't you turn that set off. <laughs> you listen to it. You, I told you now, you sit still a minute. You know me well enough. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell something I can't prove in the Bible. He lost his top-ranking, most anointed angel, the first man he ever created, first woman he ever created, the whole earth and all the fullness therein, a third of the angels at least. That's a big loss, man. I mean, you figure all that, that's a lot of real estate, brother. Gone down the drain. Now, the reason you don't think of God as a failure is he never said he's a failure. <laughs> and you're not a failure till you say you're one. God's reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. I mean a reproduction of himself. And in the Garden of Eden, he did that. He was not 
a little like God. He was not almost like God. He was not um, subordinate to God even. And Adam is as much like God as you could get. Just the same as Jesus, when he came into the earth, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He wasn't a lot like God. He's God manifested in the flesh. And I want you to know something. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifested in the flesh. Do you know what else that has settled then tonight? This hue and cry and controversy that has been spawned by the devil to try and bring dissension within the body of Christ, that we're God's. I am a little God. Yes. Yes. I have his name. I'm one with him. I'm in covenant relation. Yeah. I am a little God. Critic, you are be gone. anything that he is. Yes. Jesus volunteered to go to hell. I'm going to tell you something. Ain't nobody ever got out of there. He became sin. He was made sin. Now he's in the pit of hell. He's down there. He's in there. Suffering like no man has ever suffered. Death and all of, all of hell's emissaries have piled in there on him to annihilate this one called the Son of God. And he, God began to speak and Jesus became the firstborn from the dead. He was the first man to ever be born again from sin, sickness, demons, death to life. First one. He's the second man to ever be born again, period. So these are a couple of the people that were the start of the Word of Faith movement that is now more commonly known as the New Apostolic uh, Reformation, uh, but years ago it was also referred to as the Manifest Sons of God, uh, the Latter Reign. It's now also known as Dominion Now Theology. It used to be called Joel's Army, the Third Wave, and the list goes on. They just keep changing the names uh, to to reinvent it, and you know, like good marketing to try to push it in a way to suit the people's needs, tickle their ears and focus on a, a new exciting thing that people can get involved in. Uh, one of the biggest churches involved with this is Bethel Church in Redding, California with Bill Johnson as the leader. Uh, we've seen a few of the people, but like I say, Bill Johnson is a big proponent in this. Peter Wagner is actually the head of everything, uh, followed with Todd White, Todd Bentley, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, Joyce Meyer, Heidi Baker, Patricia King, Rick Warren, and so many more around the world. This is the fastest moving um, movement of so-called Christianity around, and so many people are getting swept up in the signs and wonders, which we will talk about later. But first, let's take a look at Bill Johnson and his church, Bethel, and some of the people directly involved with him. I don't know, did you know that Jesus was born again? I asked the first, first service. And he said no. Today I have begotten you. The second psalm. You're my beloved son. Today I have begotten you. Acts 13 tells us that that phrase from the Father, today I have begotten you, is in reference to the resurrection. So he was born through Mary, the virgin, and then he was born again in resurrection. The first one to touch him was Mary, the virgin, when he was born naturally. The first person to touch him when he was born again was Mary Magdalene. The Virgin Mary touched him in the law, and Mary Magdalene, the harlot, touched him in grace. I have an acquaintance with the Lord now, but 
sitting on a plane, gold just started manifesting, literally just started falling. People could see it falling on him. And the stewardess came over, stunned. She ended up getting saved. People all around him started getting saved because just he's just sitting there. And the Lord would appear upon him. And people would see it, and they would get saved. Just this gold would start manifesting, start falling. It sounds cool, but you don't get to turn it on, and you don't get to turn it off. It's, are we willing to become a sign? It's an invitation for him to manifest himself as he pleases. I had a, I had a pastor say some things that hurt me really bad. Hurt me so bad, messed me up emotionally, mentally, really messed me up. Nothing physical, nothing like that. A, a, a pastor I, I really respected said some words and hurt me so bad. And one time I was laying on the floor, actually it was in this room, I'm laying on the floor and in, an, in a vision, in an encounter with God, in a vision, Jesus picks me up and holds me so close that I can't see anything. And he holds me so close and Jesus starts to weep. And he says, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I said, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Now, I don't know if you just understood that. But he's claiming that Jesus was asking for forgiveness from this guy. Who is this guy? Well, this is Seth. Seth Dow. September 9th at Bethel Redding's Facebook page, they posted a brief clip of teaching by Seth. He discussed the emotional hurt he experienced in the hands of another believer emphasize the needs for forgiveness. Seth, what the heck is wrong with you? I mean, to come up with these visions, these experiences. This is the Apostolic Reformation, I believe it's called, and it's incredibly dangerous. We've heard about the Word of Faith movement, and if you have any questions, please post your comments. But this, they're going to a whole new level. Gold dust and experiential, basically putting theology aside and discounting the Bible. Everything is about experience. And here's Seth explaining a story about being hurt by a fellow Christian or by a pastor. And in the vision, Jesus says to Seth, please forgive me. This, ladies and gentlemen, is utter blasphemy. As if Jesus, the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, would need to be forgiven by any of his sinful creation. Just to even think of this is stooping to such a level. It's sad. I don't even know what we do in a case and scenario with a huge mega church such as Bethel with the music and Jesus culture. And they're just spreading such lies and dangerous deceit. Let's continue on. Please forgive you. He said, when that pastor hurt you, it's as if I hurt you because he's a member of my body. Please forgive me. And when we hold on to pain from other believers or other leaders. Okay, Seth, that's about as much as I can take for tonight. I'm going to be sick to my stomach. It is the Bethel blasphemy alert. And we're putting it out there and letting people know this isn't right. Hi, I'm Andrew Strom, author of the new 2015 edition of Kundalini Warning, a false spirits invading the church. 
And the main reason we've put out this new version of the book is because of Bill Johnson and Bethel Church in Redding, California. Now there's no doubt that Bill Johnson is one of the most influential figures in the charismatic world today. But what really concerns us is what's going on behind the scenes at Bethel. This is what a bunch of drunk Bethel students look like. <laughs> All of this footage comes from within Bethel itself. Obviously, as you can see, they're into spreading this drunkenness anointing, just like the others we've looked at. For years, Bill's wife, Benny Johnson, has been the senior co-pastor of Bethel alongside her husband. And this woman is into some truly weird new agey stuff, reflexology, and much more. Benny Johnson herself put out this picture. She's lying soaking on C.S. Lewis's grave. These are students from Bethel's School of Ministry and they've been photographed around the world lying on the graves of dead Christian leaders. There's a teaching in some of these circles that you can soak up the anointing by lying on their graves. Here's Bill Johnson himself at the grave of the wife of Smith Wigglesworth, the famous healing evangelist. Of course, people say that Bill Johnson is such a great teacher, such a great writer, but it's actually what's going on in the background that concerns us, the spreading of New Age practices, the spreading of a New Age type anointing, a foreign spirit. Those are the things that really worry us about Bethel. In 2012, the Bethel crowd put out this book, The Physics of Heaven, and the subtitle says it all. Exploring God's mysteries of sound, light, energy, vibrations, in quantum physics. Many Christian leaders, when they've read this book, say it is one of the most new age things they've ever seen. The contents are unbelievable. Just the chapter headings alone are proof enough. Vibrating in harmony with God. The God vibration. Dolphin therapy. Quantum mysticism. Human body frequencies. What on earth is a major ministry like Bethel doing, promoting such a weird and mystical work? Of course, this deeply New Age book is still sold on the Bethel website to this day. After all, that's who it's come from. There will be more on all this, a lot more, in our upcoming YouTube video, the fourth in the main series, Kundalini Warning. Amongst other things, we'll be looking at how Bethel has spread its influence to millions and millions of young Christians around the world. My own eyes. So look out for shocking documentary number four, Kundalini Warning, coming soon on YouTube. And then to break over limits and experience increase. So let's say you've got a faith measure for, I don't know, let's take a financial area. Let's say you've got a faith measure for believing for $1,000 a month to come in. Well, when the breaker anointing hits you, you'll break over into increase. So your faith will allow you to even double or triple that amount. I ask for the breaker anointing all the time when I'm believing for things for our ministry because God's always giving us new vision. I thought, if you don't give the breaker anointing, how will we ever break into it? We need so much increase to make that happen. So the breaker anointing, whoa, 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 ho, ho, ooh. I don't often get visited like this during a film shoot, <laughs> but I'm getting visited right now by the breaker anointing and the Lord just, whoa, told me that even though he himself is the breaker, whoa, he's assigning a breaker angel to our ministry right now. Oh, whoa, whoa, oh, wow. I can feel its presence and its power right now. And um, I'm not going to stop the camera just because this is happening because it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, wow, whoa, whoa. 
Okay, to break over the limits, to bring increase. I think this is a sign from God that as a ministry, we're going to break into new territory. But I impart it to you who are watching right now too. Whoa! That you break open through into new territory, increase and abundance and multiplication over you right now. In the name of Jesus, I ask for the dispatching of this breaker angel that's just come into this this uh, filming right now. That that breaker angel and the company of breaker angels get released to you in Jesus' name. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> woo. It also means to use violence and to burst open, to spread and to distribute. Does that sound like the gospel? Spreading the good news, distributing. Whoa, the good news of his power. So I'm still in this visitation. It's awesome to be broken through, to be broken down and to break away. It's an awesome, awesome anointing. And it's also a person. The breaker is Jesus Christ, and he is in our midst. And, um, the very first time I ever went into the wine cellar in heaven, and there is wine in heaven. The Bible says so. And, um, whoa! And I went into this wine cellar, and there's all different kinds of wine. There was barrel after barrel yep. after barrel yep. after That's barrel all. of That's wine. All. And there were names, like labels on the wine barrels. And there was like the wine of peace and the wine of joy and the wine of health and the wine of strength, the wine of prosperity. And the room was full of angels. And they looked like they'd been imbibing. They were made to live in that room, I, I think. But, uh, whoa! They smiled at me and they said, would you like some? <laughs> and I said, yes, I would like some. And um, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, I never want my people to be drunk on the world's wine. Yeah. He said, this is the real wine oh. of the glory. This is the wine of the kingdom. And he says, and I want you to come anytime you want. <laughs> and drink as much as you want. <laughs> Any kind that you want. <laughs> Whoa! And, um, ho! I tell you, the doors to the wine cellar are opened in this room. You know, heaven is not eons away. It is one sphere away. It is one step of faith away. You got to get that by download of Revelation because I don't have time to unpack it right now, but I can. I can. But, um, oh, he, whoa. Hebrews 9, verse 24 says this For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. The, the phrase holy place there, whoa, <laughs> equals heaven yeah. in that scripture. It says so, right? It says into heaven itself, not a holy place made by man's hand, but Christ has entered into heaven itself. Then it says, therefore, brethren, <laughs> since we have confidence to enter yeah. the holy place or to enter heaven itself, we can enter heaven itself, how? By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil. That is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near. To what? Heaven itself. To the wine cellar in heaven itself. How? With a sincere heart. How many of you here have a sincere heart? In full Assurance of faith. Show! In Jesus' name, the bar is open. The wine cellar is open. Just come on in and drink, 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 drink as much as you want. Because we can live in the house of wine. The house of wine.
You know what that banqueting table scripture in Song of Solomon means a house of wine. Come on! Yeah. Go grab your wine, your wine, it's your wine. Go grab your wine, go grab your wine, go grab your wine. I declare a happy hour. Drinks are on the Lord. Drinks are on the Lord. What's it gonna be now? What's it gonna be now? Come on, speak what you need. Peace. disciple the nations to preach the gospel of the kingdom thank you and to all the world to all the earth to every creature and all creation <laughs> there it is Unify us in the glory. One mind, one accord, with that spirit and that sound that's in the light. For the tempo, of the rhythms, of the cadences, the vibrations, the frequencies, the songs, the dance, the motion, the movement, the light, the light. Bible is a great book. <laughs> you are a great book too. He told me to, he said, it's the year of the cloud and the year of the open book. <sighs> I've had an interesting week, to say the least, interesting week. We've had uh, a situation come up. I, I don't ever uh, take time for this on a Sunday. Usually if uh, there's a problem that comes up, we're pretty much able to deal with it separately. But we felt as a staff and a leadership that I needed to um, kind of alert you to something. As, and then I'm going to do a teaching, kind of a spinoff from that. And uh, so this is an absolute uh, burden and concern to put out um, walls of protection because of the impartation that is actually a demonic impartation has taken place. In over 40 years of ministry, I've never seen one individual be able to spiritually contaminate so many in one night. So right now, I'm sensing, I'm sensing really strongly. Uh, <laughs> it's going to sound a little odd, but too late. Uh, I want you just to t take in the spirit realm that crown that's on your head and just place it upon someone else. They're going to just get wrecked all over the room. You just gonna, okay? Don't don't do it. Don't do it like it doesn't matter. Do it in the most impartation most impartation that you've ever believed for right now you're going to impart to each other so you're going to take it you're going to put it on somebody else's head a watch and then say more lord Whoa! more lord everybody place place that anointing that crown that gift upon someone else's head Keep praying. Every single one of you, impartation, legacy, 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 
legacy, increase your glory. More, Lord. Try it again, try it again, try it again, try it again. More, Lord. Fire. There's fire. Place it on their heads. Find somebody. I think he's got it. Shake up, Baba. Fire. Place it on another one's head. Fire. Legacy. Legacy. As the greatest thing you've ever seen in your life. Prophesy over them ten times. Start to prophesy over it ten times. What I've seen, let it be. Ten times what I've seen, let it be. Ten times what I've seen, let it be. Believe for it. Ten times. How much legacy do you want? Ten times. Ten times. Ten times. More Lord. More Lord. More Lord. Ten times. Put a crown on their head. Whatever anointing you have in your life. Whatever anointing you have on your life, you just put it on the next person and you say ten times, ten times, ten times, ten times, ten times, ten times. Ten times. Ten times. Ten times, ten times, ten times. Well, giving away, giving away, giving away, giving away. There's something about giving away, giving away, giving away, giving away, giving away, giving away. Just keep giving away. Keep giving away. Try it again. Pray over another one. Ten times. Anything good I've ever seen. But I'm telling you, I've given you a secret here. As Masato goes about directing his energy to the people in the room, many in the audience seem to be receiving what Masato's trying to transmit. And on stage, Rex and the others seem to be nearly possessed. Place it on another one's head. Fire! Legacy! Legacy! you've ever seen in your life. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Labor. Labor. Stay focused. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Now. Now, Lord. The blessing from the Lord. The blessing from the Lord. The blessing from the Lord. Now. The blessing from the Lord. The young youth and anyone else who has the grace to grasp their significance. And grace is what Katagama is about. God's amazing grace. Occasionally, temple officials supervising the frenzied possession themselves going to trial. They recover in a short while, usually after holy water is sprinkled over them. Dynamic meditation is a new age combination of Hinduism and psychotherapies. This exercise involving rigorous breathing and hyperventilation is...
designed to arouse the serpent force called Kundalini, which the gurus believe lies coiled at the base of the spine. People will shake under the power that we're he, he wants, he wants, he wants everyone. He, there's not much, not much more time. He, he aches and he, he grieves. Sometimes people will cry. Sometimes people will laugh. Sometimes. Sometimes people will be slain or go out under the power. And even bizarre things can happen. I feel like God just healed them. You came from Scotland to this meeting? Yep. And yeah. what did you come here for? I came to, to catch the fire and take it back to Scotland. Take the fire back to Scotland and be healed with asthma. Yeah! I feel the power of God coming on him. My God, let a mighty revival break out in Scotland. Come on, use the young people in Scotland. You're watching me in Scotland. Fire, 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 fire's coming to Scotland. There's a youth revival in Scotland. says his goal is to create a new man, one who is happily mindless. In the creation of the Rajneesh ideal, the mindless man. Some of the people, they like, like they go into a trance. They just, they lose all connection. Uh, uh, uh. Shabbat 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 
notice that the Holy Spirit moves in different ways upon different people. And it all depends upon a person's openness to the Spirit, their personality, and their culture. Here in Latin America, the culture is intense and passionate, and it comes out in the way that the Spirit moves in them. Lord, your glory! Lord, your glory! Lord, your glory! Lord, your glory! Miracles in our hands! Miracles in our hands! Miraculous! For those of you who wonder about this, you have to realize that the Holy Spirit manifests Himself in power. And it is going right through them, even in the way that electricity might be going through someone. But it charges them with the fire of God for them to carry the anointing to do exploits. Put her in there, put her in, put her in there. That's the fire. That's the fire of God. 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 It's miracle anointing. More. 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 anointing her hands for miracles. Her hands are on fire, burning with the Holy Spirit. It's a miracle anointing. Shh. Yeah. Get him, get him, get him, get him, get him. Get him. Hey! the impartation was so heavy that even Matt could no longer stand up under it. Now for those of you who have never seen anything like this type of footage, we'd like to refer you to the book of Acts. Second chapter, verse 14, the Apostle Peter defends the way the early Christians were staggering, saying that they are filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And the spirit being released into these youngsters is to empower them to administer the same anointing onto others so that revival fire can be spread throughout the world. So as we can see, there's some really disturbing stuff going on with Bill Johnson, Bethel, and this whole new apostolic reformation movement. I'm just brokenhearted seeing kids and so many people falling into this trap, this this evil masquerading as godliness. And, the, and that's the, the problem with a lot of this is that there's so much... Bible being preached, but then the deviations twist it all up and people are already sucked into it and hypnotized by these evil leaders. Um, it's pretty easy to see that that is not the Holy Spirit. Those are demonic Kundalini spirits, the same as with Hinduism and demonism. It's, it's just not Christian and I don't know how anybody can't see that. Um, this whole drunken movement, that's sort of the lighter, happier side. What we saw at the end there was not happy at all. People crying, twisting, manis manifesting like we saw in the Bible, twisting, screaming and torture when a demon possessed them. But demons can also trick you and give you a drunken happiness to make you think it's more of a holy, godly spirit when it's still just as deceptive. So let's take a quick look at that. <laughs> she wouldn't do it. <laughs> okay, help God. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. <laughs> so here we go. Shaba. <laughs> I can't believe this happened again. Whoa. <laughs> wow. Oh. Okay. Shaba, shaba, shaba. see me here and you think this is how I always am. <laughs> it is <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Carol said I didn't have to get it together so <laughs> us out yet I mean I'm just I forget you're so, you're so nice you just let people get toasted right in church it's like huh? I have to get it together so often and you don't even care it's like <laughs> some of you in the background <laughs> probably do but I understand. I'm just going to lie here for a minute because you guys aren't f playing fair at all. And I'm just, I'm just going to talk from here. I haven't done this in years. Oh, God. Anyway, Shaba. I was considering, um, whoa, when I came here. Just close your eyes if you're worried, please. Oh, I, whoa, I came here about, uh, whoo. 11 years ago, and um, I was going to go work at Kmart. Whoa! 
with my um, <laughs> theological training. I was like, <laughs> I was so tired. And then, whoo, about two weeks ago, I graduated and I decided I'd go to work at Nordstrom's. <laughs> it's true. I thought maybe I could cut my, you know, maybe I could, maybe I could, whoa, maybe I could comb my hair. I said I had no qualifications, so I don't know who else would hire me. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked Shara to help me write a resume so it'd be spelled correctly. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't do it. <laughs> okay, help God. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so here we go. Shaba. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I can't believe this happened. You now see and hear. They heard them speak in a tongue, but what did they see? For them to think they was drunk, they must have thought they was drunk. They were acting like drunks. Manifestation of that anointing. We got there. Yep. We got there.
This is an ancient form of yoga, and its followers believe that a good belly laugh in the morning stimulates the soul and sends positive vibrations to everyone around you. Let's say in laughter exercise, we do start uh, as a fake laughter, as a kind of uh, forced laughter, but when you laugh in a group, you have a good eye contact, it turns into real. So you can get away with it by faking it, you yes. still get the good effect. Yes, so we have a slogan called, fake it, fake it until you make it. <laughs> I shot the sheriff. And I shot the deputy too. <laughs> Whoa, the sheriff is legalism. And the deputy is religion. Mm. That's that's good, isn't it? That's copyrighted now. All right, you you can't copy it. <laughs> I didn't ask for this. No, I, I didn't. The problem was, when I came through the doors in November 94, and the Lord said to me, what do you want, John? I said, I want to get drunk. But I forgot to tell him for how long. I don't mind being drunk. It's great. But I said to the Lord, Lord, I don't like looking drunk. 
you know your eyes get bloodshot and And he said to me, John, you see, some of you think God doesn't talk like that, but he's very, he's a fun God. Let's get the fun back into church. And he said, John, you see the rock stars? when they're on the TV the next morning being interviewed on breakfast TV, do you notice they always wear sunglasses? So he said, get yourself a pair of sunglasses. <laughs> I call these glasses glory shades. No. I'm sure Moses would have wore them if they had sunglasses in the Old Testament. Ooh. Now, hang in please. Hang in. Fasten your seatbelt. We may have a bit of turbulence tonight. <laughs> and you may want to run, but hang on in. Let's go back to the reading. Luke chapter 1. Verse, verse, verse. Oh dear. <laughs> Luke chapter one. I can only imagine how Jesus would be feeling if he saw Paul and the other apostles teaching the people in the olden days like the people were seeing there. Uh, it, it's ridiculous, it's unholy, and it seems to be what their itching ears want to hear and their sensual natures want to embrace. So. Let's move on uh, to another part of this movement uh, is signs and wonders. There's been a lot of miracles, and I'm a big believer in miracles. The Holy Spirit has not changed since the day that uh, the apostles walked the earth. There are still signs and wonders, but as we saw in Scripture before, the Bible also says that there would be false teachers and false representatives of Christ that would be doing great signs and wonders, so amazing that even the elect could be deceived. And this next guy is somebody that I, I really, really liked for a long time. Todd White um, seemed like such a down-to-earth, good-hearted guy, and, and I'm sure he really is. But once again, we're going to find that Birds of a feather really do flock together, and he's fallen right in line teaching all the same ungodly things as Benny Hinn and all these other teachers. And uh, we're going to take a look at uh, a little bit more on Todd White right now. reality of this thing is that Jesus Christ, he pays a price for us to be made right with God. Jesus goes to hell, I believe. He went to Hades. He went down and descended into the depths of the earth for three days and he pays for the sin of mankind. But on the third day, 
on the third day, he got the keys to both hell, death, and the grave. Got those keys, came up out of there, was resurrected. Jesus is born of the Virgin Mary. She is, he is born as a man. He's not born as God. He's God's son, but he had. Jesus, when they had in Mark 2, when the man was lowered through the roof because they couldn't find room, so they kicked the hole in the roof, lowered this man down, four men did, lowered this para, you know, paralytic guy in front of Jesus at the meeting. You know they brought him to be healed. They didn't, that's why they brought him. So Jesus looks at this guy and he goes, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. They didn't bring him to be forgiven. They weren't even thinking about that. They brought him to be healed because miracles were going on. That's why everybody was pressing right? And Jesus spoke with life and the Pharisees reasoned in their hearts, like, who does this man think that he is? Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking, which means that me as a Christian can know what people are thinking. That's pretty crazy. You better be ready for it because people think some weird stuff. So That means that the person that's addicted is not my problem. The things that are possessing them is my problem. So what if that person that has no idea who Jesus is, the reason why they don't is because they're completely addicted, they're blind, they can't see, they don't know who they are. But if I'm a believer that can see, and God says that anything I ask according to His will, He'll give it to me. He says that anything I ask in prayer, believing that I've received it, I'll receive it. He says that God's desire is that none perish, but that all be saved and come to the knowledge of Him. Yeah. If that's what God's Word says, and I'm a believer that's empowered with truth, and I serve the King of glory, mm -hmm. then I can actually claim somebody that doesn't believe, and there's no way for them to get out of it. And I've watched so many people, drug addicts, alcoholics, all that stuff. That means that the person that's addicted is not my problem. The things that are possessing them is my problem. So what if that person that has no idea who Jesus is, the reason why they don't is because they're completely addicted, they're blind, they can't see, they don't know who they are. But if I'm a believer that can see, and God says that anything I ask according to His will, He'll give it to me. He says that anything I ask in prayer, believing that I've received it, I'll receive it. He says that God's desire is that none perish, but that all be saved and come to the knowledge of Him. Yeah. If that's what God's Word says, and I'm a believer that's empowered with truth, and I serve the King of glory, mm -hmm. then I can actually claim somebody that doesn't believe, and there's no way for them to get out of it. Yeah, I definitely feel something. Yeah, 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 it's like numb, yeah. tingliness on the tip of my fingers. So Father, I just release the power of God into his hand right now in Jesus' name. Just tell me if you start to feel something. Feel anything? Wow. What happened? I don't want it. It's tingling. Tingling? Why? Why? Because that's the presence of God, man. He lives inside of me. And by faith, I can release the power of God. And so can you if you believe in Him. Just pressure and tingling everywhere. Oh, it tingles. <laughs> oh, it's weird. Yeah, let me show you something. Put your hand out like this. I'm going to pray for you and the power of God's going to touch you, okay? All right. This is really real. It's not magic, okay? I don't, uh, it's all real. Now watch. Uh, Jesus for John, show him that you're really real. Touch him with your power right now. Let your power just come on him. What do you feel in your hand? Wow. Wow. 
Double it. You feel that? Yeah. Now watch. Really? Jesus, let it be like a weight that comes all over his hand. You feel that? Yeah. It's pretty crazy, huh? Yeah. I can't do that. Now that's, that's, I don't have that kind of power. Electric went down my fingers, across my face, and it numbed the bottom part of my face. I never felt anything like it. And it felt like I was plugged into a light socket. Yeah, it's hmm. like the vibrations up in me are going up and down. The vibrations up in me are going up and down. <laughs> But wait, it's a magnetic field. <laughs> you feel that? Yeah. Is that funky? Is it tingly in your head? Yeah. Come on, God, more. In Jesus' name, more. My viewer, in the series of clips that you just viewed, can you tell me which men were witches and which men were professing Christians? In the pictures that are on screen now, can you tell me which men are professing Christians and which men are witches? If you look very closely, my viewer, you'll see that their hand gestures and the following manifestations are exactly the same. Is it at all troubling to you that the bottom right hand corner and the bottom left hand corner profess to be in two contradictory kingdoms, one of God and the other of Satan? Does it trouble you that the top right-hand corner and the top left-hand corner confess to be in two contradictory kingdoms, and yet they're doing the exact same thing, the exact same way, with the exact same manifestations and the exact same results? This man's name is Elon Bendelman. He would call himself an energy healer, and he is a witch. Hey guys, today I'm gonna to show you just how easy it is to heal the body using energy. Let's go. This man's name is Mitchell Ramsey. He is a professing Christian. He frequently preaches and leads at City Point Church and Glory City Church of Australia. And he also leads in what is called the Jesus School. The fire of the gospel is in me, man. I'm alive and in love with Jesus. Man, if you, if you stick your hands out, and, oh yeah, I reckon you're going to feel the presence of God in your hands. Really? Yeah. Do you reckon? So, Father, I just release the power of God into his hands right now in Jesus' name. Just tell me if you start to feel something. Feel anything? Wow. What happened? I don't want it. It's tingling. Tingling? Why? Why? Because yeah. that's the presence of God, man. He lives inside of me. And by faith, I can release the power of God. And so can you if you believe in Him. I'm Robert Love. And I'm Destiny. And we are here on Pearl Street in Boulder, Colorado, awakening people to energy. Let's go! Data activation. Oh. It's like expanding right here. It's like a ball of energy. You know, you've seen those rave kids like hold the ball. Well, he feels like a resistance, almost like a ball, like a balloon. And you can feel this energy. This is real. This is Jesus. Wow. Now, to show you, Lord, Jesus, I'm praying to Jesus right now. Jesus. Put your face forward and say a healing prayer into the ball. I would like healing, please. You can say this for anything. Anything at all. The truth is, when you get in the presence of God, you know, you, you actually, He energizes your spirit. You're like a, you're like a battery drained from life, wow. and you need His energy to come on you, to actually charge you or recharge you to actually live life. What this is doing is, you're calling down the energy from up above, from the divine. You know, stick out your right hand. Now watch this. Uh, Jesus, I ask you, there, it's already touching you right now. Do you feel that? My palm? Yeah. Right here. Now watch, double it more. So you felt like a static electricity went through your body? Yeah. Now what did you feel in your hands? In my hands, it was like a magnetic pull and push, and then like a heat static friction kind of feel in between the palms, and you had the energy ball going through. Now have you ever felt anything like that before? No, I haven't. 
what would you say to skeptics? People who think like, oh, people can't feel energy. I'd say come talk to you guys and try it out. This kind of thing can be traced back to a man named William Branham. He confessed to have an encounter with an angel. He described this orb of light or this whirling ball of energy that appeared to him as he was fasting and praying on a mountainside. He spoke of the following interaction that, the, that he had with this angel and how this angel was going to be with him. And this angel was going to empower him and speak to him and reveal to him the secrets of people's hearts so that if he was able to get them to believe in him or that he was of God, they would be healed by this angel. Where is that? Well, that couldn't be coming. I looked around and here it was above me, this very same line. Right there above me, hanging right like that. Circling around like a fire, kind of an emerald color, going I got just above it, like that. And I looked at that and I thought, what is that? Now, it scared me. I heard somebody coming. This angel was referenced and described by William Brenham himself as an orb of light or a whirling ball of energy. And he had a very shocking expression of prophetic and supernatural power to spellbind the masses. Not unlike Todd White. Now, my viewer, you need to understand this man is not to be trusted. He was a oneness Pentecostal, which means he denied the Trinity. He denied the omnipresence of God as well. He believed that Jesus would return in 1977. He believed that there were three Bibles, the Zodiac, the Pyramids, and the Written Bible. He also was a companion to Kenneth Hagen and Gordon Lindsay, two other notorious false prophets that propagated demonic manifestations and the like. This man was an utter deceiver. He was unparalleled in his power, expressing miracles in all of his meetings, giving praise and adoration and thanks, as it were, to this angel, this orb of light, this ball of energy, that he would wait, literally, to start his meetings until this ball of energy appeared to him and joined with him on stage. Now, this is the reality. You'll see on screen here uh, a picture that he claims captured this infamous whirling energy wheel that was whirling over his head in a meeting that he was at, which was not an uncommon occurrence to catch a glimpse of this, apparently. My friends, this is an abomination. This is an abomination, and it is no different than the life and ministry of Todd White, which is right now soaring and flourishing all across YouTube and the world. And I believe, according to the sovereign determination of God, to hasten the blackness of the end times, such men like Todd White and the like are going to rise in power and in fame to the destruction of many multitudes. Heat, that's crazy. <laughs> Heat, right? Yeah. By the way, touch my hands just to make sure. Wow. <laughs> they're, they're freezing cold, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. I said, I just want to tell you I love you, and I'm really sorry for what the church has done to you guys. What do you mean? Well, the church has beat you guys up and told you that this, that, and the other thing. I want to tell you that God loves you. And you have no idea he loves you because a lot of people look at you and they're like, oh, yeah, they're a witch or this and that and the other thing. And they're like, yeah. I said, well, I don't. Now give me a hug. Come on. What's, I'm a Christian. Are you afraid to hug me? And they came over like. <laughs> it's weird because 
A lot of times when a Christian approaches somebody that says they're a witch, they walk away or they walk around them or they tiptoe yes. around them because they're afraid. Yes, there's a power of darkness and it's real, but the power well, of this is amazing, guys. I looked at the one girl and I said, you know, and I don't just say this because I go after witches. I don't. I love people. I don't just single out the witches of going into this town and I find all the covens. I don't do that stuff. <laughs> I'm not God's detective and I'm not God's cop and I'm not out there looking for people. I'm just loving people. And if I happen to come across somebody, they're no different than somebody else. Amen. They're just twisted up in their belief system. And a lot of times with witches and stuff, they've been crushed by the church. They've been beat up. So they've pressed to an alternate sort of power that is very limited. And they could have had all this. But because they got oppressed and pushed out, they chose another way. Yeah. And Jesus is the way. Mm -hmm. right. So you need to be the power source of love for them in order to come into the kingdom and to not be afraid to come in. So I said to her, I said, you know what? This girl right here, I said, you, hon, she was the leader. I said, you've got something going on right here in your head. I said, and it's not so good. It's something bad. What's going on? She said, I have a pituitary tumor. I said, I say, you let me pray for you. I say, Jesus crushes this right now. I say, you let me pray. She goes, go ahead. I said, all right. So I put my hand on her forehead. I said, you girls, do me a favor. Put your hand on her. I said, say, in Jesus' name. And the two witches go, in Jesus' name. We command this tumor to go. We command this tumor to go. Because God loves you. Because God loves you. Now her forehead is on fire. That messes theology stuff up. Because they're witches praying for their witch sister that has a tumor in Jesus' name. And so I am back like 150 feet from the stage and I'm like trembling because of this electricity. And you said, bring that man. And you pointed right at me. And I'm like, and the fear of, of, of what was going to happen to me went through my body. And it was crazy. And I'm like, what's going on? And these guys, they came through and they got me and they brought me up on stage. And I'm up there and you were praying for people and, and they were getting up and you were having them picked up. And then you looked at me from about probably 20 feet away, probably as far as I am if, from you. And you went, Jesus like that and the Holy Spirit hit me here and the two ushers that were with me lifted three feet off the ground and flew about ten feet back and I'd never been lifted off like a rocket ship before and so I laid on the ground and I was under this electric surge of current on the ground and you had to pick me up but I couldn't put my feet under me because they were in the fetal position and then the second set of ushers the same thing happened and the third thing happened the third time and you prayed four times the fourth time I was down on the bricks uh, down below the stage there and they came up to get me and I, I couldn't walk so they helped me get back to my hotel that night and I was went back to my bedroom and I had been touched by the Lord so mightily and, and that severely changed the course of, of, of my future um, and as far as the presence of God being upon my life so I just personally personally want to thank you for what you've done in my life and you I can't say thank you enough because you've really impacted my life and I just want to tell you I love you thank you Benny love you Let me help by see an amazing guy that stands behind anybody and everybody. Wow. Someone that like you do anything for anybody. Yeah. You give the shirt off the back. Your mom raised you that way. Yeah. You're amazing. Oh wow. That's a really good <laughs> thing, man. It's Thank really you. good. It's one really one true. I see music. Yeah, man. Yeah. Are you um do you do you play guitar? Yeah, I do. Play guitar and write music, right? Yes. Okay. And right now you have some songs that you really want to get out there. You have some originals, right? On. You have about four or five of them that are real solid, dude.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Isn't that awesome, man? It's mm-hmm. so good, dude. Do you have something going with your back, too? Just one. Do you have something going pain in your back? Do you have any? Every once in a while. Yeah. Do you have, um, have you ever gone to like chiropractors or anything no. like that? Nothing. What kind of work do you do? I see computers too. I also see like a recording engineer. I see somebody could actually record and, and behind the glass, man, and to see people back there and to say, look, this one goes out, this one stays in. That's you, dude. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing right now? Like, what do you, what's your thing? What, what kind of... Uh... Come on, man. Let me see it. He's a solutions architect. He's a media. That is so awesome. How's your shoulder? <laughs> you have rotator cuff problems. Oh, wow. Yeah, mm-hmm. this one. <laughs> Come here, man. This will be really cool. You'll love this. Yep, here. Did you do sports thing? When you were yeah. Running? Football? Yeah. Were you a tackle? Yeah. You were right tackle. Yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> is that good, man? It's good. Is yeah. one of your knees blown out? Did you blow one of your knees out? No, but I did hurt one. About a month ago. Yeah. Does it still pain in it right now? Yeah. Oh, you're going to love this. It's your left knee? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> you should be feeling something funky in your leg right now. Feel moving, yeah. I guarantee you do. <laughs> Should be getting warm in there. Is it getting warm right there? It might, I don't know. No, it's okay. More or less, it's still the same, but you know, maybe, maybe. Look, let me ask you. Like, when you grew up, you didn't grow up in a Pentecostal kind of church. You grew up, did you grow up in like a Catholic kind of church? Nothing. Nothing at all. When you, what were your parents when you were younger? My mom was Lutheran. Lutheran, mm-hmm. and my dad was nothing. Nothing at all. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm going to ask you this, and this is so good. You've heard the story about Jesus. You've heard the crucifixion. You've heard the resurrection. You've heard that stuff. What happened today? The reason why it happened is because he was crucified, and he paid a price to get us completely washed clean completely washed clean. He paid a price also for you to be healed. All this stuff happened because before he hung on a tree, what he did was he went through massive beating. Did you ever see the movie The Passion? I'm not. I've it's, heard about it's it. It's serious, man. He went through all that stuff, right? And when he went through all that stuff, he paid a price for your body to be healed. And when he ascended on the third day when he came out, 40 days later, he ascended. And what he did was he sat at the right hand of God and Holy Spirit was poured out. And what Holy Spirit does is he comes down, makes his home in the heart of man so that you can live with heaven flowing through you all day long. This is exciting. This is exciting. Now let me ask you, this is for real. Would you not like to have this flow through you on a constant basis? I'm being serious, man. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be good? Come on, man. You ready? Come on, man. Ready? Come here, dude. Pray with me, okay? Just gonna, it's so easy, all right? It's so easy, it's simple, it's a free gift. He paid a price, all you do is say, okay, I'm ready. I swear that's as easy as it is. Watch, just pray this. Lord God, Lord God I'm asking you, I'm asking you to, come in to come in right now, right now. To, wash me clean to wash me clean and to teach me who you are. Teach me who you are. Holy, Spirit, Holy Spirit, I'm inviting you, I'm inviting you right, now right now into my life to be the dominant force to teach me who you are in me and who I am in you. I give you my life today. And I'm asking you, make it what you want. I'm your man. Lord Jesus, I believe in you and I want you to show me what it means to be a man of God in Jesus' name.
Now I'm going to pray something real quick. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God, for my brothers. God, I'm asking you right now, come, Holy Spirit. Let your presence come right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Let your presence come right now. More, God. More, God. Yeah. Jesus name. Amen, man. What do you feel, man? Feels good. Feels yeah. good. <laughs> Feels totally unique, totally different. Yeah. God has come and set up residence in here, dude. Mm -hmm. And I have this amazing thing, dude. It's going to sound funny, but I made a bracelet today. Mm -hmm. And this is what it says. He healed my life. Come on, man. Because this is a total thing, dude. Total. I only made one, man. I wish I could split in two. So for all the people that are saying that Jesus was only a man and not born as God, let's look at what the Bible says. John 1, 1 to 2 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's pretty straightforward to me. John 8.58, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. And we know that God is the great I am. John 10.30, 33, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. So even the Jews recognized that Jesus said he was God. John 14, 9 to 11, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? These are verses that very simply tell us Jesus was not only man 100%, but he was also God 100%. So that gives you a little bit more about Todd White and some of the beliefs uh, that don't line up with the Bible. Jesus not being God, when Jesus God, the Holy Spirit, our one, Jesus made that very clear, um, going to hell, being born again, and all the other stuff. Now, Todd is probably most well known for his so-called miracles um, and being a prophet. But as we saw in the last video, his prophecy isn't too accurate. It's sort of a hit and miss. And his preaching of the gospel lacks a little bit, uh, such as sin and repentance, which is pretty important to understand why Jesus died for us. Um, but as I said, he's known a lot for his miracles, and one of the big things is the leg lengthening so-called miracle, which has been proven by many to be an old parlor trick. And we're gonna get into some of the popular people that do this today, Todd White, uh, Pete Cabrera, and Torben Sondergaard. These are three guys we wanna look at and exposing the leg trick with atheists doing it um, and Christians showing how you can do it. Uh, you can learn this online, but let's look at that right now. Right leg, you're gonna lose. Come out. I'm not holding you. Come out. What the? Come out. Come out. Look. Look. Watch this. Come out. Come out. Come out. Oh my god. Come out. Oh my gosh. Ooh. Look, watch this. Right leg, come out. Oh, More. 
More. More. More. Look. Look at his knees. Look at his knees. Look at his legs. Now look. I don't know if you want to. I don't care. <laughs> <Look>. <laughs> oh my gosh. Look, straighten him out. Look. Ready? In Jesus' name. Oh my gosh. There you go. <laughs> Dirty feet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, get real quick. Okay, that was how how much? About four inches? Mm-hmm. About that much? Mm -hmm. You wanna do it again? Let's do it again. Push. <laughs> two inches. Or at least Ready? Jeez, okay. You straight, Jen. Do you feel all straight? You're like yeah, totally straight, straight, straight. I'm gonna push. Okay, nice right leg, come out right now. Ho, ho. Now, ho. faster, right faster, 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 faster. Whoa. Faster. Yeah. faster. Ho. Ho. More, 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 ho. more, 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 ho. more, 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 ho. more, <laughs> 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 more. <laughs> More. Oh. <laughs> More. Oh. Oh. Okay, just go yes. back. Go back. Oh my God. Go back. Oh. Go back. Whoa. Level up. Okay, oh, go. Yay. Stop. Stop. Oh, no, come back. Little bit. Little bit. Okay, okay you never said. Watch this, Julie. Right leg, grow. Grow. More. 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 Okay, left leg, you come out. Did you see that? Yes, that's a miracle man. You saw it. That was awesome. Put your feet out for a straight ahead of you. Put your heels together. Now you tell me what you see. Take your. What do you see? Your legs. Which one's longer? Which one's shorter? You see it? You see that? You see his leg? Isn't that weird? Yeah. Watch this. This is going to be so cool. I'm going to pray, and Jesus is going to grow his leg out. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Left leg grow. Right now. Thank you, God. Let me hold your legs. In Jesus' name, left leg, I command you come out right now. You feel your leg stretching? You feel something funky in there? Stand up and check your back. I, yeah, I guarantee. Walk once. It'll feel weird to even walk. And how many you have two legs? And see, I've come two years, and one leg is short and not. One, one leg is short and short. Can you go back sitting? Can you see this leg? Come here closer. See, this is short and not. What's your name? Shelby. Shelby. Oh, God, I thank you for you right now. There she goes. Just push the shoe back on. No, it's not Shelby. It's fine to stay now. Let's watch this again with no sound on. Gets the leg out. Ask the cameraman to come in. Watch the left foot. He pushes the shoe. You can see him do it. Look at that. Look at his hand. If this is for God, why does he need to do this trick? Look again. Watch. Watch. Pushes the shoe back on. Look at that. Oh, watch closely what he does. Pulls it out. You can see him pushing the shoe back on again. And it all depends on what type of shoes these people have as well. He's a charlatan. See what he does with this one again. There we go. And he pushes it back in. Watch this one and you'll see him push the shoe out. There you go, you see? Did you see the heel of the shoe? Let's see that one again. And again, proving that it's tall and doing it. And um, you'll see very, very clearly what he does. Trying to get into it, right? 
watch. There we go, pause it out. Look at that. Hey guys, Epidemic 2020 here today, and I just want to start off by saying that if your position is true, you don't need to lie for it. Right? So, if you believe in the Christian God as I do, which is an all-powerful, all-loving deity, I think you'll realize pretty quick that he simply doesn't need you to lie for him. So a lot of faith healers are pulling off the same obvious parlor trick. These guys have been pulling your leg for long enough. I'm going to expose this trick, and there's two ways to do it. There's an easy version that uses an accomplice, and a more difficult version that can work on absolutely anyone. So here's a bit of a very sloppy con man attempting to do the easy version, and then I'm going to try and pull off the same exact thing. Never met before, right? No? Okay. So it's everybody that's in the room, okay? Okay. Anybody that says this is a hoax, okay? Watch it. Ready? Okay. Jesus name. Ready? Right leg. This is left leg. Yep. Come out. Come out. <laughs> Ready? Okay, give me real quick. We'll do it again. Ready? Okay, this leg now. Ready? You can put your hands up in the air. You don't want people to think you're moving in the chair. Leg come out. Ready? <laughs> now, make sure you sit in your chair. I don't want people to think that you're moving. Sit straight up in your chair. Straight. Okay. That's straight, right? Okay. I don't want people to think this is like a lot. Right? Okay? Put your feet together. Right? Now, you're not shifting, right? Right? Okay? And this is the left leg, right? Yep. Okay. Command the left leg to come out. This is just like a video. <laughs> Never met before, right? No. Okay. So it's everybody that's in the room. Okay. Okay. Anybody that says this is a hoax. Okay. Watch it. Ready? Okay. In Jesus name. Ready? Right leg. This is left leg. Yep. Come out. Come out. <laughs> Ready? Okay, give me real quick. We'll do it again. Ready? Okay, this leg now. Ready? You can put your hands up in the air. You don't want people to think you're moving in the chair. Leg come out. Ready? <laughs> now, make sure you sit in your chair. I don't want people to think that you're moving. Sit straight up in your chair. Straight, okay? That's straight, right? Okay. I don't want people to think this is like a lot. Right? Okay? Put your feet together. Right? Now, you're not shifting, right? Okay? And this is the left leg, right? Yep. Okay. Command the left leg to come out. So I've seen well over a hundred of these videos on YouTube of people performing this miracle and it makes me wonder, I mean this isn't a miracle found in the Bible or performed by Jesus, so why is it that all of a sudden it seems like the easiest to fake miracle is the one that becomes the most prominent? Hmm. Out of all these hundreds of videos of people performing this, they all set it up and execute it the exact same way as the conman's trick requires. You would think that if people could perform miracles like this, they wouldn't need to set it up just like the conmen do. And nobody actually is able to verify it either. It would be so easy if you just take a measuring tape and measure the length of your shin, then you'd be able to tell if anything actually changed before or after your little experiment. And out of all the claims of people being able to regrow bone and muscle fibers and tendons and ligaments, you don't see a single video out there of somebody regrowing a lost fingertip. Uh, I mean, even someone regrowing a fingernail would be a way more impressive parlor trick than the one we're seeing now. Now, to be fair, there is a harder version of this trick out there, one that doesn't use an accomplice or doesn't require an accomplice and uh, can actually be performed on skeptics. I'm going to go ahead and show you guys how to do that version of the trick now. 
All right, you have several people trying to do this trick for real. I'm the clip on the bottom. Uh, there's a couple different ways to do this. Some involve pushing. I'm going to show you a version involving pulling. As you can see in the top left, the person's banging their feet together. That's a simple trick that gives you just a little bit extra distance fairly quickly. But in general, you want to do this trick slow. So just steady pressure towards yourself while grabbing their heels. The slower you go, the less likely they are to pick up on what you're doing. Uh, and you just pull on both feet, but pull on the one you'd like to lengthen slightly harder. And eventually, you'll get your desired result by shifting their hips and making their leg appear to grow. If you like videos like this, feel free to subscribe. The next video I make is going to be demonstrating even more impressive tricks that you can actually convince skeptical people of. Uh, and I just want to end with a little message saying, if you're a Christian, please don't do this. You make us all look bad. Uh, I'm going to leave you guys with one more video of a person performing this trick to see if you guys can now uh, see it for what it really is. And as always, test everything. Hold on to the good. we got Carl, and what he's doing is he's I'm lining up. Carl, he's lining, lining up. up. He's right here. Up. Like this? Can you pull it up like this? Yeah. Okay. Now so let's get a look here. Okay. How much difference would you say? Um, that is? Maybe a centimeter. Maybe. Okay. You see it? Got it on there. Okay. Now. Now, Brandon, it's your left. You're gonna feel it. God's gonna let you feel it come out. And then you're gonna do me. Father, in Jesus' name, left leg. I command for you to come out right now in Jesus' name. More, Lord. More. 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 Finish it. More. More, more, more. I said, come more, more, a little more. Yep, right there. See it? Okay, bring it up. See it? And you see the heels are lined up. All right. There it is. Did I pull your leg? Mm -hmm. Come on, it's your turn. Second part to our video here. Now, Carl just grew out Brandon's leg by about That's a centimeter. Right. Oh my God. Whoa. Is this your right one? Left. Say so left leg. Command it. Right. Here's the difference left right leg. there. All right. Okay. Left Look, leg. Knees are down. Look. Left leg, I command you to come out right now. Oh, I feel it. Whoa. Oh my God. <laughs> Whoa. Oh my God. I it. Whoa. Oh my God. I felt it. <laughs> More. It's going past it. Oh my god. Wait, wait, wait. You want them to be even? Wait. Uh, all right, go you back. Ask the other one. You can ask the other one. Oh my goodness. Look at that. <laughs> right. Look at it's that. just coming on its own. Oh my god. <laughs> That's crazy. Right leg. Come out. Line up. Oh my god. It's coming out. It's lining up. It's coming out. It came out a little past. Tell the left leg to come out now. All right, left leg. Line, line up. <laughs> it's right there. I think it's lining up. Is it good? Is it good, Millie? A little bit more to the left. Uh, call his left leg out a little more. Left leg a little more. I can feel it. Go. I can see it. A little more. A little more. Come on. Call it out a little more. A little more. Come out. Come on, like you mean it, man. If miracles were animals, this would be a horse because of how much it's been beaten to death. This miracle is the most widely and most debunked of all the faith miracles rap sheets. A quick search on Google will show dozens of demonstrations on how to perform this yourself with little to no training. Nearly every single faith, religion, denomination, and practice can do this effortlessly, which is why I'm sure it's a hot selling point for Pete based on its easy to use presentation and almost clear results. Now, if leg lengthening was truly being used to honor God, it would be used to help heal people, not put on a show of growing a leg longer than it needs and then commanding it to go back. How can anyone think these people are men of God? So there you have it. Leg lengthening 101. Anybody can do it, atheists included. Just find a website and learn how to do it yourself. We never saw the apostles lengthening legs in the New Testament, they were healing actual diseases. Now, Pete Cabrera is probably most well known for doing that. I don't know why he's not out healing other people, if he can really heal people through Jesus Christ, uh, but he seems to have a real leg fetish or leg lengthening uh, desire. So uh, he is also a false teacher. He teaches that you can learn how to speak tongues, which is not true. You cannot learn how to heal. You cannot learn how to speak tongues. These are gifts from God, and that is that. You don't learn a gift. A gift is a gift. So I just wanted to do a short clip on Pete Cabrera and tongues. So what I want to talk about today 
is speaking in tongues. <laughs> That's my favorite. So here's what I'm saying. When we speak in tongues, we're creating a language between us and God that no one else has heard because it's between me and God. So I'm working on my language between me and God through the Spirit. So what I do is I get somebody and I'll say, okay, um, just mimic me, right? Mimic me. It's funny, people say, how do you say mimic? Oh, you're not supposed to do that. I love it when scripture says um, that we're to model our walk, right? After Christ, so we're mimicking Christ. Anyways, so here we go. You guys ready? So here's what we're gonna do. Borrow my tongue. Just borrow my tongue. You know, pause right here and, and write it down wherever the time's at, right? And I'm gonna do this with you, okay? Usually I start out with Abba, right? Abba means Father. You guys know that, right? Right, Abba, Abba, Abba's amazing. So here's what I'm gonna do, I'll go slow, okay? This is a training video. Training video how to pray in tongues, right? Pray in tongues. That's awesome, I can feel the Holy Ghost. I can feel the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost in the house. My house haunted. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost in the house. Look, he. Okay. Anyways, anyways. I'm crazy. You have no idea. I'm just crazy like that. But anyways, here we go. Ready? Here we go. Just mimic me. Just mimic me. Ready? Just mimic me. I'll go. Just, okay. So we'll start out with Abba. So you ready? Anybody could do this. Even if you pray in tongue. That's my bulldog, he's getting excited. Yeah. So here we go. Abba. Abba sala. Derese que le masa. Endese que. Dese que le masata. Emberete. Dese ele meseke. Embeshete que le masa. Emberetusu kirini mata. Kala na maseke te kereche. Now, I'm feeling that. I'm not worried about you. I'm feeling that because that's between me and God. Now, if anybody else doesn't feel it, I'm okay. I do this because I want to teach you. So now, you may have tried to stay up and fell behind. We're going to do it again. But this time, if you fall behind and you can't say the words, just make something up. God knows your heart. He knows why you're doing it knows why you're doing this you want to get closer to him you want to learn this right you have all the gifts already you must well walk in it Holy Spirit's looking at you like yeah he has this he's stepping out in faith he's believing that he can do this and that's really what growth is about okay so this time I'm gonna do it again and if you fall behind just make something up you can catch up no problem okay ready so we'll start off again ready so Abba Abba Lassa Erete se, endeshe, kerete masa, embe kelereshe, tere kelele masa, ende se kelele basse, ende kele ba, tere ke se kerete she kelele masa, embe kele ma, ete se le ke she tere te, ende ri masa kala le masse, ke te she kelele masse, embe tere se, ambasa, pere su kurota sa kala la she. So if you want to keep doing that, you can rewind it a little bit, right? And you can do that again. So once again, everybody, that was Pete Cabrera and the nonsense of learning how to speak in tongues. As I said before, spiritual gifts are just that, gifts from God and not something you can be taught. That is not in the Bible anywhere. Now, this next guy is somebody who does 
follow all the teachings of the New Apostolic Reformation, but he's not part of the same crowd as the Bill Johnson, Todd White, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn crowd. He's got his own movement called the Last Reformation, and I'm speaking about Torben Sondergaard. He does all the same leg lengthening. He's big on that, like Pete Cabrera and Todd White um, and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And at first, he did seem like a very solid guy. But the more I listen, the more I found the errors of his teaching that contradict what God's word, the Bible says. So once again, you be the judge. God will ultimately judge the heart. But if we see fruits or signs that they give that are red flags and oppose what God said, we must expose these guys. And you guys be the judge if he is a man of God and what he does is biblical. And how many you have two years? And see, I've come two years and one leg is short and not. One, one leg is short and short. Can you go back to your back? Legs. Can you see this leg? Come here closer. This, this is Sean and another one. What's your name? Sean Bees. Sean Bees. Oh, thank you for you right now. There Push she you. goes. Just push the shoe Can back you? on. No, it's not Sean. Try to stay now. Let's watch this again with no sound on. Gets the leg out. Ask the cameraman to come in. Watch the left foot. He pushes the shoe. You can see him do it. Look at that. Look at his hand. If this is for God, why does he need to do this trick? Look again. Watch. Watch. Pushes the shoe back on. Look at that. Oh, watch closely what he does. Pulls it out. You can see him pushing the shoe back on again. And it all depends on what type of shoes these people have as well. He's a charlatan. See what he does with this one again. There we go. And he pushes it back in. Watch this one and you'll see him push the shoe out. There you go, you see? Did you see the heel of the shoe? Let's see that one again. And again, proving that it's Torben doing it. And um, you'll see very, very clearly what he does. Can I get into it, right? Watch. There we go, pulls it out. Look at that. What is the gospel? This is the gospel. When Peter rose up on Pentecost and they asked him, asked him, what shall we do? He said, you have to repent. Call on Jesus, repent. A new life is done inside of you. Then you have to get baptized down on the water and rise up again. So you're a new creature. And then you have to get baptized with the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. And the sign is always speaking in tongues and prophesying. Did you catch that? Torben says that baptism is always followed by tongues and prophesying. That is not true, my friends. And this is just one thing Torben twists. Let's listen to that again. And then you have to get baptized with the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. And the sign is always speaking in tongues and prophesying. I was in Canada a short time ago. I was preaching the gospel. Many people came and chose to be baptized, but a few came to me and said, told me, you need to baptize me. I want you to baptize me. And I said, no, I did not come to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Did they got baptized? Of course, because the gospel is baptism. But I did not baptize them. They got baptized, of course, because the gospel is baptism. But I did not baptize. And, and there's people who are quoting me for saying something I, I don't say. I encourage everybody to go in and see the 20 lessons on the Pioneer School. Go in and see it. If you go on the internet today and write, is baptism necessary for salvation? They will quote the hard part of this, the hard part of this, this and then they will quote what I have in my hand. And try to do it, try to go in, just, it's so funny, go in, write on Google, is baptism necessary for salvation? 
Find some of those articles where I say no, it's not. And you will see this quote taken out of context because it's actually talking about baptism. This quote taken out of context because it's actually talking about baptism. And then this quote taken out of context. Corinthians 1.17 Paul says, For Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made void. Look here, Tom. Look here. Christ did not send me to baptize. Paul says, Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the cross, to preach Christ. But this is not what he's saying. He did not say he did not baptize. You have to read text in context. And this is often those people think they are so smart and we are the one with the sound doctrine who are quoting that. Try to read it. You are part of a conversation there where Paul is saying that there is division in the church. Some say I belong to Apollo, some say Caiaphas, some say Paulus, and uh, some say Christ. Have Christ been divided? Was it me you got baptized to? Was it Paula? Who did you get baptized to? No, you got baptized to Christ. So they're talking about who they were baptized to or who they got baptized by. We also say like that. And they discussed that. And then Paul said, hey, stop. Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach Christ. He did not say he did not baptize because he said, I'm happy I did not baptize any of you. They, okay, I baptized him in his house and I baptized them and I baptized them, 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 them. So he baptized them actually. But he said it in that context. Like I a few weeks ago was in Canada and I quoted this scripture in the right context. Because what did I experience in Canada? Somebody came to me and said, Tom, 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 you need to baptize me. I want you to baptize me. I have just preached the gospel about repentance, baptism, water, Holy Spirit. 130 people want to get baptized. And somebody came to me and said, Tommy, I need you, you, you to baptize me. Do you know what I answered to him? No, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Did that mean he did not get baptized? No, because he got baptized, because the gospel is part of, baptism is part of the gospel. But he All right, as we saw, it's almost the same as the last video that we watched. But we see here that he says that baptism is part of the gospel. Again, we look at the, we look at the verse, we look at the context of what Paul's talking about. That's simply incorrect. That baptism and the gospel are two separate things. That no one is saying that baptism is not important. And there's an aspect in there too that Torben didn't mention. That were you baptized in such and such as name. But Paul also says, was Paul crucified for you? We see also in the context that it's ultimately about Christ and him crucified again, as we see in there. That's the whole context of Paul writing this. That it's not saying that baptism is not important, but Torben seems to completely miss the point over and over. It's very troubling, actually. Now, as we heard uh, here, he said, when you look up anything that says, if you look up, does baptism save? And someone says, no, that is to say, he's actually saying he believes baptism saves. Now, almost every Christian would say, the person who says baptism saves is a works-based salvation. That is to say, they believe their works will redeem them. However, one important point to stress right away is we want to say this, that the last reformation isn't wrong on everything. There are certain things they get so right, but it, there are these small things that they get wrong that tend to go by unnoticed, and it makes it so deadly. Do I believe that baptism is part of salvation? Yes, I do. Of course I do. This is what I read in the Bible. Do I believe that baptism saves us? Yes, this is what I believe. But, 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 I'm not saying that if you're not baptized, you are lost forever. It depends. I believe that baptism saves us, but not in that way that baptism in itself saves and is enough. No. We need to get saved, get saved, and get saved, and the one who keep on to the end shall be saved. The fact is, Torben, is that you keep saying baptism saves, and then add but, 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 and try to explain why it's not only baptism that saves. The truth is that baptism has nothing to do with salvation. Repenting and putting your faith in God is all that needs to be done to be saved. This is a different gospel. So, um, but I believe 
If you ask me, can Chris have demons? I believe no. The answer, the answer is yes, they have. Okay. A true born-again Christian cannot have a demon. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So he's a new creature and the old is gone. So there cannot be a demon left over. You will see that even Torben's partner agrees with this. But the next clips are probably the most disturbing with this movement. Torben repeatedly baptizes new converts and then starts babbling in tongues and casting out demons from them. This is a misuse of tongues because scripture says that two or three at most should speak in public and only if there is someone with the gift of interpretation. And secondly, I believe that these are demonic spirits being imparted on these poor people. This is not biblical. The reason why I believe we're seeing this happen now is because when that old man dies, demons lose their, their grip and their grab. They, they can't, they can no longer torment a dead man because the old man dies. And when you come out of that water, you're somebody brand new. There's a new man <laughs> wearing your old clothes. We're starting to battle. What is happening there is the wrong spirit. And there's this new team that's got 
Oliver Wall spielt ein sehr, sehr fortes Song. So soon as he came out of one of the streets, he moved the song. That's not a whole spirit, this is a fortes song. But with that demon is gone, then he started with the right song. Look. Why is there a fight going on? Because Sesame don't like it. But now we are going on the water and then she's going to come up and you're going to see a freedom. You're going to see a freedom and a new life. Look at it, just kneel down. Don't be afraid, lean down. Just kneel down. There's freedom. No, you can, you can, you can, you can. You can, in the name of Jesus, you can. You can, it's a new life. But Satan is a liar. Satan is a liar. He has been lying, he has been lying, and he don't want you to give everything over to Jesus Christ. Because when you give you over, he's going to set you free. Now, like I said, I'm sorry to put everybody through so much of this, but it's important to see that this is happening in so many countries all over the world. And I just wanted to point out here that as Torben said before, baptism is the gospel. Now, he was saying to this girl that she's giving her life to Jesus now as she's being baptized. Well, that's not biblical. You've got to repent, give your life to Jesus, and then you are set free. The baptism comes after. This lady looks terrified. Let's continue. And Satan's going to lose and you don't want this. It's free, it's in you. Yeah, it's coming up. You can. My knees don't want to bend. No. Go down in the name of Jesus. And she wants you, she can, her knees don't want to bend. She cannot get out. There is a fight going on. But in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you. Just go down. In the name of Jesus, just go down. Down, down, just go down in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, go down. Go down, go down, go down in the name of Jesus. Go down. Are you ready? Are you ready to get baptized to Jesus Christ? So on your own faith, we baptize you to Jesus Christ. Just go down. Die with Christ, up with Christ. These are truly deceptive times, my friends, and we can see all these false teachers are preaching the same message, doing the same tricks, and moving towards the same terrible end. There is one more common thing they have, and that is they are all moving towards the ecumenical movement that the Pope is pushing right now. The Pope is trying to bring all religions together, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, and saying we worship the same God. We know this is a lie, and that's what the Antichrist wa wants. So watch these next clips. Don't take my word for it. Take a look for yourself. La mayor parte de los habitantes del planeta se declaran creyentes. Esto debería provocar un diálogo entre las religiones. No debemos dejar de orar por él y colaborar con quienes piensan distinto. Confío en Buda. Creo en Dios. Creo en Jesucristo. Creo en Dios. Allah. Muchos piensan distinto, sienten distinto, buscan a Dios o encuentran a Dios de diversa manera. En esta multitud, en este abanico de religiones, hay una sola certeza que tenemos para todos. Todos somos hijos de Dios. 
Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Confío en vos para difundir mi petición de este mes. Que el diálogo sincero entre hombres y mujeres de diversas religiones conlleve frutos de paz y justicia. Confío en tu oración. Here's the deal. I believe that the Catholic Church and the Christian Church are going to come together right now. In the name of Jesus, God, for a mighty baptism on the Catholic Church, God. Jesus' name. I honor these men. I thank you in the name of Jesus, God, that they represent you. I thank you that Azusa is going to be a mighty outpouring on the Catholic Church. Oh, Heavenly Father, as Lou Engel taught us, we need to fly united. The only way we can heal a divided nation, a divided world, is with the United Church. I have a very important video to show you, and I wanted to just preface it with an information that will help you to understand what the Catholic priest is saying uh, as he prays during this Azusa Now quote-unquote revival. He's basically saying that when the hearts of the fathers are turned toward the sons and the sons are turned toward the fathers, he's talking about the Protestants being turned back to the Catholic Church. He said that's when revival is going to take place. He also alludes and, and references uh, Elijah and Elisha. And when that anointing fell upon Elisha, that, that, uh, that they had to be submitted to the uh, to Elijah, which they say is the Catholic Church. So what you're seeing is a ca this very same thing that happened to the Charismatics. The Pope reached out to the Charismatics. The Charismatics basically kissed the feet of the Vatican again. And basically that's what we're seeing happen amongst the Charismatics, uh, Pentecostals, and the Word Faith uh, teachers. Here's the video. Heavenly Father, you taught us through St. Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians that the eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, nor can the head say to the foot, I do not need you. But the truth is we all need each other. And Lord, we know that you want to re bring revival yeah. in our world and in our nation. But we will not have revival until we have reconciliation. And as Elijah prepared Elisha and Israel for revival first, they had to be reconciled to turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons, and the hearts of the sons to the fathers. And so, Heavenly Father, it is my prayer, going forward from this historic day, we can all forgive each other. We have to forgive each other. And if we become united, our witness will be powerful in the world. We need to unite. And so, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, has made a covenant, a covenant for Christian unity. So as his representative here in the local church, I make a covenant with Lou Engel and all of you here that going forward from this day 
we must fly united. This will bless Bruno, I think. They just released a study that more people are healed in the Catholic Church than Pentecostal churches. No, it's a fact. That's an absolute fact. The studies have proven it. Because Catholic people revere the Eucharist. More people get healed in a Catholic church during communion than Pentecostals during church attendance or communion because to us it's symbolic. Well, Jesus did say, this is symbolic of my body. He said, this is my body. He didn't say, this is symbolic of my blood. He said, this is my blood. And I believe, I always have believed that in the spirit, it is his body. In the spirit, it's his blood. So you revere it. There's healing in communion. Absolutely, I've seen it happen in my own ministry. And there's healing in the Catholic churches because these people are devoted and show up every Sunday. They don't church hop. We hop, they don't. That's why we're sick and many of them are healed. Amazing. Because they believe as I believe, you must be faithful to your church. It's all about the church. I think we miss that in our Pentecostal circles. Don't be afraid, says the Lord. One more time. Great future for you, Tom. Ah, great future. Great future. We truly are in the final days the Bible spoke of with false teachers, false signs and wonders, and everything coming to a close with this ecumenical movement of having a one world government, a one world currency, and a one world religion. Now, I want to talk about one more guy here named John Crowder, and he's got his own ministry as well, and he takes the drunken glory to a new level um, as well with lots of false teachings. But if you haven't heard of this guy, he comes across as a well-spoken guy at first, but that doesn't last too long. <laughs> Today on the show we have John Crowder. He's a Christian mystic, a preacher, and an author, and he's here to talk about his new book, Money, Sex, Beer, God. So tell us a little bit about the book. Yeah, okay, so uh, yeah, we're uh, just excited to get it out, finally. I mean, uh, I've been working on it for a while. It's it's something that uh, that I've actually taught on for a bit because the emphasis is God is, God is pro humanity and uh, he, he baptized the material world in the incarnation and, and these things like money and sex and beer things that get vilified in the church I mean how long have we had vows of poverty and vows of celibacy and and uh, you, you know you've got the whole abstinence from all alcohol and the whole temperance movement you know uh, and, and the, these natural world gifts that God's given have been vilified when in reality it's not about cutting them out of our lives, it's it's an issue of seeing how to filter these things through the word. And so that's uh that that's really the gist of of the book. Yeah, so we, we look at these things. I, I do take a, a bit of uh quite a bit of church history. Um uh, I even show how these these Greek dualistic mindsets of separation, which which plays right into what you're talking about, this sort of schizo God who uh is happy some days and um and, and wants to fry you in your own fat and in the fires of hell the other day and so the gist of the book is that god is pro pleasure uh he's got no problem with you being loaded uh he wants to give you the 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 hottest nookie on the planet uh he he, he created alcohol i mean he made grapes to ferment uh, i almost want to add too because that was amazing i almost want to add too it's like it's when you start to realize who the uh true self really is and your identity in christ or even just if, if you're not even a believer, if you just you know believe that you yourself are a good person, um, you are loved, you are accepted, you are approved, and that's that's really been the core of our message for uh, I don't know how long is you know that that we are holy, that we're not sinners. This this whole crazy idea of 
indwelling sin, which I mean, it's it's just nuts to me that to to say that you're you're in union with Christ and that you're holy and that you're not a sinner is considered heresy today. I mean, it's just it's just crazy how far the church has gotten askew. Um, you know, we have this idea we got this uh, like our spirit man. You know, spirit, soul, and body. Our spirit man is is way out in this untouchable, positionally holy. And then you've got this middle layer of soul, and then your physical, material body is way down the ladder. And um, and, and really, that's not even a, a biblical concept. Now, I'm not saying you don't have a spirit, soul, and body. Maybe you do, but the Bible never says it. Oh, Jesus. Oh, dear Jesus. Oh, Lord. <laughs> yes, Lord. I've learned a, a quick prayer. I'll teach it to all you really quickly. Okie dokie, Lord. Okie dokie. Lord, I love your heavy, drunken glory. Uh, Lord, I love it. Lord, thank you, Father, for more of the heavy, weighty, drunken glory in this house today. That's my favorite little bit of you, Jesus. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Is the bliss, is the joy. Oh, oh, oh. You know, Isaiah 35, it says, you will be overtaken by joy. That means taken over by joy. That means possessed by joy. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Lord. Oy, oy, oy. We just thank you, Lord. That we have these little fat friar tuck bartender angels that travel around with us, and they wheel in the barrels from heaven. Some healing angels that come, but let me tell you, these little fat friar tucks, they start yanking on your legs, yanking on your arms. You better watch out. You know, we need a little help around here. I think it's okay to talk about the angels in the church. Amen? Yoing, yoing, yoing. Help. We need somebody. Help. I mean, if we think we can get along, oh, just, let's just focus on Jesus. Don't talk about the angels. Just focus on Jesus. Don't talk about human beings or animals or any other creature the Lord's created. <laughs> I think maybe we need to learn a little bit more about the spirit realm. What do you think? <laughs> we just got to get gotten. Lord, I just get, just get me. Just get me. Come, Lord, get me right now. We just want to be overwhelmed, over. And absolutely whacked, slosh, slippity slap. Just fill us up, Lord God. We wanna, we wanna just ride, Lord. That glory track. All right. Do you know throughout church history there have been many saints who show up more than one place at a time? Like you show up, two of you, two Johnnies, two Jeffs. Right. So we've been pressing in for this for a while, Lord. We want to bilocate, levitate, lev levitate. You know, third heaven. Just give it all to me. I want everything, Lord God. I want everything from it. Just pour it out. Dump it on. You know, I want it. And so. So we're, we have been pressed in for this for a while. I showed up in Ireland, although I was in Georgia. This just happened a few weeks. happened actually on my birthday in August. Uh, I wake up, and uh, uh, I didn't even know this, but my, uh, uh, some associates of ours were in Ireland. We were supposed to go to a meeting in Ireland. Associates are there. They're preaching in Ireland. And, uh, and he looks over, and, and they had been feeling like I was there all day. They were kind of joking around. They were like, the spirit of Crowder's are here with us today. You know, like the spirit of Elijah. Is it, I'm not Elijah. <laughs> he looks over, and then, and then there I am. I'm standing in the meeting, and he's surprised. He thought that I had actually just, you know, changed my ticket, come anyways, because I was originally supposed to be in Ireland with these guys. Above it all, I mean, I will take any day over the week, uh, uh, you know, I'll take over a miracle, I'll take the heavy, drunken glory. You see, that, that is the secret source of success. Get whacked, stay whacked, never go back. We are going to be a people that are so whacked out. Actually, there is coming a corporate trance on the body of Christ. <laughs> it's coming to brainwash us. And many of us are literally going to be caught into ecstasies, caught into trances where we will be taken out. I mean, people, some of your friends will think you're comatose. Many of the Christian mystics throughout history, they would go so whacked out in trances that their spiritual directors didn't know whether to call the doctor, you know, the morgue or what. Sometimes people would, they would go into such heavy ecstasies and deep soaking prayer that they lost like their vital signs, like their heartbeat. They didn't know if they thought they were dead. And then since many saints...
It was as if they died over and over and they'd come life again, but they were just ecstasies and bliss of God. It would be encountering things in the heaven. What God's about to do is many of us are going to be so whacked out on the Spirit, we're going to be going for weeks at a time on like, like spiritual battle. Like imagine Rick Joyner's final quest, going and like, like participating in something like that for like a whole week. Instead of taking a vacation at Disney, you're just going to go off in the Spirit somewhere. Earlier this year, uh, I was in a meeting. I was in Ohio, and a, an angel came into the meeting. He had a long silver cord, and he's swinging this cord around him. He releases this cord, smacks me right in the chest. <laughs> and the Lord said instantly to me, he said, I'm lengthening the silver cord in this hour. I want you to just lean over to your neighbor. I want you to find a drinking buddy. If you're sitting on the end of a row, you need to find a partner. Go on, crawl over to somebody. If you can move. I need you to reach over. And I, I want you just to find their vein. And just find their vein. And I just want you to shoot them up. Jesus on the vein line. Tell him what you want. And now share the favor. One of these guys who floated, his name was the Flying Friar, <laughs> Joseph of Cupertino. Have another, have another. I know the first miracle that Jesus did, he turned the water into wine. And I just rest assured that he has turned all of my experience with God into wine. <laughs> so that's, I just want to say that before I start, that wine is very intoxicating and he has turned my experience with him into a long drink of wine. <laughs> And that's not my fault. I thank God for his wine. I thank God for the cup of the New Testament. A big cup of wine. And I just want to tell you tonight that he can turn your experience from water into wine. Oh, Jesus. So I just arrived here. We're in Indonesia in the hotel room. 
You can see what's happening already here. A lot of drunken shingling is all I know. No telling where this thing is going to take us. But here we go. I don't know if you can tell all the disabled people in the room. This is just the first couple minutes. I haven't showered in a couple days. Uh, I don't know what's going on. I'm whacked up. Whacked up. Day one. Uh, not even day one. This is like the first 40 minutes right here. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's for $10. I was a diplomat going through the diplomat check-in. Get customs. <laughs> and there's a lot of glory, a lot of glory. Recently, we did a video on Matthew Ford, Dave Vohan, and the Kundalini spirit. Many thought they were mocking people that mock them, but this isn't true. Both these guys are under the mentorship of John Crowder, and this is exactly the type of thing he promotes. Another one of his students is Brandon Barthrop, and this guy is all about the same stuff. He even promotes escaping Christianity, yet calls himself a Christian. I'm going to leave a whole bunch of links you can review below. Vice did a great expose on Crowder, Dave, and Brandon. But today we'll look at Matt Ford and some of the blasphemous things he's said. This video here has a collection of all these folks working together and acting all whacked out in the drunken glory. Even Brian Welch from Corn is seen here with Crowder. Be not deceived. These are not true servants of Christ. As far as Brian Welch's salvation, only God knows. But rejoining his dark and evil band Corn in 2013 makes it hard to believe he's really saved. God doesn't pull you out of such a dark and satanic place like this only to allow you to return to it and still enjoy it the same. I was never a Korn fan, but I checked out some of their lyrics and pretty much every song has F-bombs galore and the topics are dark and twisted to say the least. Even in a 2020 interview with Brian Welch, he said that he doesn't even listen to Christian music. So that is just weird. But, once again, birds of a feather flock together. And this video is about Matt Ford, so let's listen to the first blasphemous clip called Nephilim Dundee. And uh, we felt really bad for all the Nephilim, so we've got an intercessory network established where you can phone now 1-800-NEFFY-PRAYER. And we're getting people to gather just to pray and to stand in the Nephi Gap. <laughs> to pray through the Nephilim. Because we believe that it's the Lord's will that they be saved. <laughs> you can log on now to Nephilim Dundee. <laughs> Woo! We'll take you into the outback. Guaranteed to bring home Nephilim trophy. For every Nephilim you catch, we'll give you two little bottles of monoatomic gold. Guaranteed to be more powerful than the blood of Christ. More powerful than the finished works of the cross. 
Is there anything that needs to be added to this? Some model atomic gold that's more powerful than the blood of Christ or finished work on the cross? The finished work of the Nephilim, which are fallen angel demonic human crossbreeds? Yeah, enough said. The next clip is him with John Crowder and just more nonsense. Oh, maybe it's all Buddha's drink. Our umbilical cords are tied to the same placenta. <laughs> You just grab your umbilical cord out there in YouTube land or wherever you may be. And just kind of swing it around like a helicopter. Oh! <laughs> just, let just let him funnel all up. This to show that, like with the first video, them acting all whacked out is not them making fun of Kundalini. It's just how they are. Here's another clip of him acting ridiculous and talking about oil flowing from his shin. Hello people, well, we've just been uh, filming at our glory school and I had on one of my legs down on the shin, I felt this, this oil running down my shin, so I lifted up my jean leg and you can actually see the mark on my, whoa, on the leg of my jeans where this oil was flowing from my leg, just as like a prophetic sign that it's, whoa, when we go to Sydney on the weekend, we're going to be taking that oil with us. Uh, during worship or whatever happened tonight, it was just crazy in the Holy Ghost. I've got a prophetic word for Sydney, so um, check it out. This is it. My shin, and it's all on my jeans. Yeah, it's sticky. <laughs> I did have a shower before I came. <laughs> Sun, sun, sun. <laughs> Woo! Sunday m -m 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 afternoon. During work, 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 work. <laughs> Rapping in the ghost. During worship, the Lord took me up over Sydney. And I was an eagle about three times the size of the Harbour Bridge. He goes on like that for a few minutes, but I don't think any saved person would be in a church under this kind of unchrist like leadership. We're going to look at just one more clip that should finalize that this is not somebody we should be learning about God from. In this clip, he dresses up like a woman and talks about what strange fire is. This is actually a 30 minute long clip, but I've greatly condensed it for y'all. Welcome to the wine barrel, you bunch of happy, whacked up, Jesus loving squirrels. It's great to have you here on Sunday, the 20th of June 2015. Hey, we have a special guest with us this morning, one which ministers at churches all around the world, bringing the same message. And so we're a church full of grace and fire and love. We love the Holy Ghost. We love his strange manifestations. We love his joy. Whew, we love taking up the offering. Usually if it's not enough, we do it another couple of times just to get a bit more into the petty cash flow. And we just want to make very, very welcome 
our guest speaker this morning. So won't you give her all a great big hand? Oh, hello there, dear. Oh, Reverend, thank you so much for that lovely, warm invitation. Hello to everybody out there in pornography. I mean, I'm in YouTube land. My name is Mrs. Strangefire. I am the cousin. You may know my cousin. She's got quite a set on her too. <laughs> her name's Mrs. Dootfire. But you can call me Jessie. <laughs> Jessie Strangefire. I just baptised the front row. <laughs> now what I'd like to know is what breed is your seed? Be ye word of faith. Oh my. Ooh, your demons are starting to undress me. Getting raped at the front of the church here. Leave my bra strap alone. Amazing what five grand from Thailand can do. Oh Jesus, it's all, I bought my own anointing oil. Especially for you, I will be anointing everybody today. This one's garlic infused. <laughs> Unbelievable for getting rid of vampire infestations. And I believe you lot are possessed by the vampire spirit wanting to drink the blood of Jesus. <laughs> you look at me, there's so many demons running around, I've gone way off track. I ended up talking about Jesus. It would be good if I could actually read this through the hair. <laughs> what's, what's, what's going on? <laughs> well, brothers and sisters of the Lord, for the Spirit of the Lord is there with liberty. And I'm here to tell you today, there's some glory in this house. There's some glory, 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 glory. Some things you just want to dance. You're just going to shake your hands. You're just going to anoint that that's the Lord. You gotta get your Bible. You gotta get out of the old government. Holy God, that something has come upon me. It's <laughs> falling apart. We'll be back right after this short commercial break. <coughs> Book of Acts. Haven't read it before, so I'm gonna have to Google it. Where is that bit when the ghost turns up? Acts 6. No, five, four, three, two, oh, we have a countdown. You see, we have the Lord, we have the Lord. Came from the upper room, there in the place. Uh, I would just encourage you to sit back, take a little ride on the mystical Holy Ghost carpet. Oh, we've, been, um, we've been huffing um, olive wood from the Garden of Gethsemane, and we've been... Um, Sorting some dust from the tomb of our Lord and Savior. Oh, we've been smoking, baby Jesus. I want you to reach over. And I, I want you just to find their vein. And just find their vein. And I just want you to shoot them up. Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. At the start of this video, Jesus warned us very seriously that there would be many false prophets and teachers in the final days before his return. They would be kind, smooth-talking people that flatter people with words for the purpose of deception. They would perform all kinds of false miracles, signs and wonders through Satan. And many would be deceived and follow these deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the lies of people whose consciences are seared. Having a seared conscience means that their sense of right and wrong has been dulled. The same as the skin of an animal scarred with a branding iron becomes numb to any further pain, so the heart of a person with a seared conscience is no longer sensitive to moral things. Just like a pathological liar who lies out of habit doesn't see a problem with it, it's just a part of who these people are now. The Bible is clear that we are supposed to expose these people because they are upsetting the church family and leading many astray. And as scripture says, we will face eternal life in heaven with God or eternal damnation in hell after our life on earth. 
So please, if anyone you know has been following any of these people, show them this video and maybe they will be awakened to something they didn't know was going on. But what about you? If you died today, would you go to heaven? The modern church says, don't question your salvation, but the Bible says the exact opposite. It says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And if you fail the test, then it implies that Christ is not in you, and you don't want to find out that truth on Judgment Day. Jesus also said in Matthew 7, 14, narrow is the way that leads unto life, and few will find it. That speaks volumes to me. Few will make it to heaven. Not half, not even close, just a few. But as we saw before, Jesus also says in Matthew 7, 21, 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out many demons and perform many miracles? And I will tell them, Plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So few will actually enter heaven, but many will think they're going to heaven, but will not. Jesus said three times in John 3.3 3, that we must be born again. The truth is that we're all sinners. But what does God consider to be sin? 1 John 3.4 says, sin is transgression of the law. We know God's law is the Ten Commandments, so let's take a quick look at these, just a few of them. If we've ever told one lie, we are liars. If we've ever taken something that is not ours, even if it's small, we're thieves. And Jesus said that if we even look at someone with lust, we've committed adultery in our hearts. That does not even include taking the Lord's name in vain, which is blasphemy, or the other six of the Ten Commandments. So by even breaking the first three that I mentioned, we would be seen as lying, thieving, adulterers at heart in God's eyes. And if we got what we deserve, we would go to prison for breaking his laws. God's prison is hell and it's forever. But fortunately, this is not what God wants. Second Peter 3, 9 says that God does not anyone, want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now, many think, that God is all love, forgiveness, and goodness, and will simply forgive us of our sins against him. But let's look at this on earth for a moment. Picture, you are in a courtroom guilty of many crimes. All the evidence is there and you admit your guilt. The judge asks you if you have any final words before he passes sentence. You say you believe that he's a good judge and that you hope he'll just let you go. The judge says that he is a good judge, and because of this, he must give you punishment for the crimes. He could never just let criminals go, or he wouldn't be a very good judge. And God is no different. He will punish sin wherever it's found. Here's an example of God's love, mercy, and forgiveness. Let's go back to that courtroom. You have admitted you're guilty of these crimes, and the judge says your fine is $1 million, or you go to jail for life. You tell the judge you don't have the money. And then from the back of the courtroom, a man steps forward and says, Your Honor, I know this person and I love them very much. And I've given up everything I have to pay their fine. The judge accepts payment. And even though you are guilty, you are free to go. The law has been satisfied by your fine being paid for. Well, 2,000 years ago, Jesus paid for our fine with his own blood for the breaking of God's laws. He took the death penalty for our sins against him. He's the only one who has the power to do that because he lived a sinless life. And Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, guilty, Christ died for us. It's simple. We broke the law and Jesus paid our fine for us. He took the punishment for us and gave us his life. The Bible says that anyone who repents of their sins against God and accepts God's free gift of salvation and puts their faith in Jesus Christ will be forgiven and spend eternity in heaven. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 says, For grace, by grace you have been saved through faith and not that of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
So there's nothing we can do to earn God's forgiveness. No amount of good works we can do can erase the sins of the past. We are guilty, but forgiveness and salvation is his gift to us because he loves us. That is God's promise. And it is only when we see how serious our sin is to God that can, we can appreciate his amazing love and mercy. So if this makes sense and you are not yet born again, please do this today. Bow before a God that loves you and confess your sins to him. Admit that you deserve punishment, hell, for your sins against him. Tell God that you believe Jesus is his son and paid the price for our sins against him, and you'll do anything for God if he'll forgive you. The Bible says that if we're sincere about this, that at that moment, God will forgive us and we will be born again and given a new heart with new desires. We will be a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. This way, when we stand before God on Judgment Day, he can dismiss our case. Even though we are guilty, our fine has been paid for through Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross, and we will spend eternity in heaven with him.